Oh, I just got a haircut. <laughs> right. <laughs> Welcome to Nostalgia Cast, your weekly roundup of the best and most up to date nostalgic news, where we discuss the stories and give our thoughts. Ooh. I am your host, who could never beat the speeder bike level on Battle Toads, Andrew Price. It's dangerous to go alone. Take Tyler Palo. All your base are belong to Kelby Joseph and Dad Beats. AKA Kirk Pinchon. Dad beats. I would never take Tyler somewhere that is dangerous. Or anywhere. To protect him or to protect yourself from Either him. way, it's work. I'm like a Swiss <laughs> army man. <laughs> a bloated dead body and that, I has, get... that just weighs you down. Exactly. <laughs> and what's the what's the Kelby reference? And is it base as in a base <clears throat> camp or base as in like a base funky God. base? There's a uh, an iconic moment in a video game uh, that became a meme where uh, in the English localization, they... There was like a loss in translation, and it was spelled incorrectly. Uh, and so, at the end of the game, when you beat it, it says, "All your base are belong to us." <laughs> what game is this? Broken English phrase found in the opening cutscene. That's not the end. It's the oh, it's the beginning of the of the game. <clears throat> opening cutscene in the 1992 Sega Genesis port of the 1989 arcade video game Zero Wing. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> this is Zero yeah, Wing. Yeah. This is yeah, uh, this no this was this is what it looks like. This is like the 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 screenshot from the game where it says all your base are belong to us, <clears throat> and it became a meme where basically like you would post that when you like own somebody. Pwn. Oh, I like that. That's mm. good. Yeah, that's real good. I haven't heard pwn in a while. That's a mm. good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> this is a nostalgic cast. <laughs> where did the, I don't I don't quite understand what pwn. I I know what pwn. It's is. just a miss. It's like it's like somebody accidentally one day instead of typing o they typed p. Oh okay p okay p w n e d pwn. Yeah, it's kind of like okay. it. It all comes from like 4chan and and yeah. something awful forums. Like every internet speak thing came from that like in the early 2000s gotcha. like there was this thing where there was this internet troll guy who was basically like an incel before incels existed and he was like a frequent poster in like 4chan and stuff and then he ended up killing himself and everybody was making fun of him for killing himself <laughs> on 4chan and then his friend of kind of like his friend came to his defense and he typed this long ranting thing about how uh they were they were like everybody was such pieces of shit for like making fun of him for committing suicide and in this ranting thing he said he was an hero uh, <laughs> so then so then an hero became a slang term for killing yourself so like oh, if, if like if somebody ever like oh, posted no. something stupid in the forums, you would just type "an hero" and, and you're hero. basically telling them to kill themselves. <laughs> <laughs> the internet is a shithole. No, it's not. It's I don't undefeated. know. I don't know where it came from, but my favorite is uh, drop an F in the chat, boys, and just F means paying respects. Like this person just went out hard. Yeah. So I love. It's just like so simple. Wait, <laughs> say. Explain it to me because I'm old. So when somebody does something stupid and they make a fool of themselves, yeah. you pay respect to them by dropping an F in the <sighs> chat. And I don't know the actual storyline behind it, but just typing F and hitting enter, that's... That's giving respect for someone who just fucked up? Right. Acknowledging that they fucked up. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where okay. it came from, but that's what I know right. it does. Typing F into a chat is a way for people to pay their respect <clears throat> to something or someone. Yeah. I mean, that's just what you said. It, yeah, it has to be on Reddit. It, um, it started on Reddit, I'm sure. Though. The term originated after oh. a feature in the 2014 release of Call of Duty asked players to press F on their keyboard or X on their controller to pay respects to virtual fallen soldiers. Nice. So before we get into the stories, <laughs> Guess uh, I wanted to bring... Heroed. What? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wanted to uh, bring this up. So recently, Patti LaBelle oh, gosh. was <laughs> on... Careful. <laughs> I love Patti LaBelle. Patti! And her pies. <laughs> She was on <laughs> The Masked Singer, which, by the way, oh, yeah. I was at a Super Bowl party for a family member of my uh, wife's, and I guess The Masked Singer premiered after the Super Bowl, so I was kind of sitting there. I've never seen the show before, ever, and I was sitting there just watching it because it was on. <clears throat> I ended up just wanting to know who everybody was. I got, like, sucked yeah. into it, yeah. but also, secondarily, the show kind of terrified me. It was like a show that would be on in the background of RoboCop. <laughs> it's like a, it's, it's like a it's like something in idiocracy. Mm -hmm. like yeah. The, the, the oh, hundred percent. This show exists, mm -hmm. and and like I don't know. It just kind of scared me. It felt and it's just it, so flashy. It, too. it felt dystopian. I'm yeah, gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it out there. Something <laughs> like that is gonna happen. I'm imagining with Jackass. Celebrities are gonna sign up to be uh, Jackassed, basically. 
and and you're gonna they're gonna get put in situations where they're like hitting nuts so they play games where they throw a bone at each other Th- there was a whole segment segment on the on the <laughs> jackass dvds where they would play these games where everybody got bodily injured and i think that's the next step i could see that happening particularly where it's uh celebrities who've fallen on hard times yeah they're like their 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 career's kind of in the shitter yeah. that's the new and then it blows the up and then it blows up and becomes a big <laughs> thing and then bigger stars want to do i would it. love that i would love that i and mean the, if, and then we're in hell. you're gonna be a multi-millionaire work it for it, you know <laughs> <laughs> get it in the nuts mm. <laughs> guess they just got it out of nowhere <laughs> So, I mean, acting, so Patty LaBelle got voted off Mass Singer. And I guess how it works is she like She did? Yeah. This past Wait, no. Whatever, I don't know. But uh, yeah. I guess oh, how last the, season? Over. I think it was last anyway. season, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. I guess how the show works is not only are they masked where you have to guess who it is, but mm-hmm. secondarily it's like a singing competition where you're actually the judges are actually voting people based on their the vocal audience. performance or whatever it is. Yeah, the audience. So she got voted off. And then uh during an interview when she was talking about the show and getting voted off and stuff. She basically said that today's music lacks substance. Mm. And she said, uh, 60 years performing and I see changes all the time. I never know if you're going to ever go back to when real music was real music. Because a lot of things today, if a song's (laughs) title is Get It Now or something, you're going to hear Get It Now, the whole record. No substance. So there's still some growth. And I hope that it goes back to substance. I'm not saying it to knock anyone because if that's their hustle uh, and if you can get buy with get it now and say it over and over and the record sells then you did your job but i'm still looking for substance and i don't want i, I don't want to hear your thing because you're just gonna be like it's just old people being no, old. no 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 <laughs> i mean it wasn't it wasn't that gonna be that but it's like yeah. gladys knight put out a song called midnight train to georgia and she said it nine million times over and over again i'm yeah, not okay say, I'm wait not, i'm not saying that that's justifying you're missing the whole people. point 100 percent by comparing it to <laughs> but she midnight just, train to georgia she just said which like, is one of the most happy. saddest songs I know, it, ever. Does, it has a lot of substance but what i'm saying is she just said like you're gonna hear get it now over and over again there's probably more to these songs than just get it now you know what i mean well so we have a pretty good generational <laughs> spread here um what do you guys think do you guys think that today's music lacks substance compared to on my own why did it in this way <laughs> if only is, you uh, we're not gonna knew. do this. It's, we're not doing this. Isn't how I've got a new yeah. attitude. Oh my, oh my gosh! So much copyright. <laughs> I grew up on Patti LaBelle, oh, so uh, <clears throat> I've enjoyed her music throughout the years. Part of me gets where she's coming from because I'm like, yeah, I can see that comparatively to when she was in the 70s, and then mm-hmm. you know when she was influenced from the 50s and 60s. There's definitely a lack of substance, but at the same time, people said that probably about her music. They're like, oh, that Patty LaBelle with her new attitude song. That's not yeah. a song. So it's it's every generation is going to bitch about the the yeah. next generation's music. Yeah. It's it's a foregone conclusion. So I while I tend to agree, I don't <coughs> take it to heart too much because I'm like, that's always gonna happen. Right. Someone 15 years from now, someone is gonna be like, rap today, it's not as good as uh <laughs> who's the Who's the little uh, the little teen Yachty. girl oh, um, that like was um, Billie Eilish? No, bad baby. Who's, bad baby. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's good, but it's not bad baby. It's not bad baby. It's not bad yeah, baby. Yeah, good. Yeah, All this bubblegum pop yeah. shit nowadays. Guarantee it didn't. It didn't slap like bad baby. <laughs> yeah, slap. Bad baby it's slapped. going. That's going to happen. She was a real yeah, OG. Sure. You know. Yeah, that's yeah. just how it goes. Yeah, I, I think um, when it comes down to mainstream music, the stuff that is overtly pushed in your face on the radio billboards and all that stuff you can make a case for it i get it because gucci gang was a huge song you know i get it but we're probably in the most diverse time in music in history because whatever you like you can find it it exists yeah and it's not hard to find it's in your pocket yeah I, i agree with kirk but i also think that secondarily like, yes, people always are just complaining about the previous generation's music. And yeah. you could go back to being like, oh, this Baroque music isn't as <laughs> finely sophisticated yeah. as cla- as classical. Exactly. Like, like, this right. chamber music is naughty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, and like that—that that, that literally happened. Like, yeah. back, like when when Igor Stravinsky <laughs> uh, did the Rite of Spring, they performed it in this big concert hall. And, you know, the Rite of Spring is considered one of the greatest compositions of all time. And uh, whenever they whenever they did it for the first time, there was like a, literally a riot. Yeah. Like every, everyone was like, what is this raucous noise? I say nay. I say nay. Um, <laughs> because of his usage of discordant, atonal music. Um, 
that was different than the classical stuff that they were used to. So th- I, th- I agree with yeah. that. But also secondarily, I think that what she says, what she said is kind of a gross oversimplification of music. Like yeah. that, that is like, Absolutely. that's kind of a straw man. Like, I don't mm-hmm. think that that's true. I think that some music is like that. <clears throat> and then there's tons of music that's really sophisticated and has a lot of substance. I mean, just off the top of my head, if you're thinking about like pop music, like Kendrick Lamar, he has some of the most like intricate and diverse lyrics, you know, that, mm-hmm. that have their like oozing with meaning and are super complicated. Sure. And there's, there's literally like a podcast that like deconstruct the meaning of his songs. You know, there's probably a place where she comes from where she's also thinking about how the music is made. You yeah, know, that's because, a good point. You know, most of it is made on a computer. Whereas in her time, it's, you know, the talented musicians who are playing the drums, playing the guitar, playing the keys, all this stuff. So probably in her mind, it's like, ah, these kids on their computers just making trash tech music. You yeah, know? but even even then, it's just, it's just, it's a straw man and it's people just ignore or just not, are being ignorant of the reality. Because I remember like <laughs> a couple of years ago, like three or four years ago, whatever it was, Prince was on a show being interviewed. Be I think careful. It, I think it was The View. Oh, Be no. careful. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm totally throwing the Prince on the bus for this because I think it was, and you got to agree with this. Old like, and old. <laughs> but let me hear. For somebody who, you know, is who, is who he is, he should have, he should have been more knowledgeable and not kind of <clears throat> talked out of his ass like this, but Damn. He was on, I think it was on The View, mm-hmm. and they were basically being like, it was like at the height of when Justin Bieber was like his most popular, I think back during like the like girlfriend era. 2012-ish. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and somebody was, and so one of the people on The View was like, oh, what do you think about somebody like, you know, Justin Bieber, you know, the, you know just this, you know, you, you're so talented and you're a multi-instrumentalist and you play you know, guitar and piano and drums and all these things. And then you have like these singer, these pop singers like Justin Bieber who, you know, don't have that musical talent. Uh, and, you know, what do you say to somebody like that? And he was like, oh, yeah, well, I would I would encourage him to, you know, really like learn instruments and pick up the guitar and try to like write some songs on his own and all these things. And but in reality, Justin Bieber is a child prodigy multi-instrumentalist. Yeah, yeah he, he plays like drums, is. Yeah, right? he plays, he drums. plays everything. Yeah. Yeah. He plays, he yeah. plays yeah. piano, yeah. he plays drums, he plays guitar, mm-hmm. and he's great at all of them. Mm-hmm. And like, he doesn't, you know, th- that doesn't come off in his music <laughs> as much, but, yeah. y- you know, that, <laughs> at that, all. That, that's just a, yeah. th- an ignorance on the, on the part of Prince who just kind of didn't realize that and kind of spoke simplistically about this person just having no idea like oh like he's kind of like you're just being kind of condescending because Justin Bieber is he's like, younger and is mega like, famous for yeah and he's also songs. like a yeah. he's just a yeah. great musician that is really good at I, I would agree with what you're saying and I would similarly to Patti LaBelle I would chalk it up to kind of a generalized statement not digging deep but also an age thing of like oh Justin Bieber I like he's aware of Justin Bieber's music and he hears it musically and is like, no, nah, that's nothing. Because he doesn't know that Justin is actually doing all those things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he's taking it so he's taking it at face value that Justin Bieber is just <clears throat> some pretty boy pop star mm-hmm. and not digging deeper. That being said, Prince also hated rap when it first came out. Then it got big and he was like, you know, I always loved rap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my song DMSR, that's a rap song. You don't deserve to drink out of that cup. <laughs> so I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> After bat talking dance. bad about Prince. So uh, you out there in listener land, what do you think? Do you think that today's music lacks substance? If you want to have your answer read on air for next episode, you can email us at nostalgicastpod at gmail.com, and we'll take a poll. Do you think that today's music lacks substance? I will read their comments right <laughs> now. <laughs> Nothing is better than when Biggie and Tupac were rapping. Next, <laughs> next, comment. next comment. I miss the old days when name a white people band. Uh, uh, Pearl Jam. When oh. Pearl Jam was on the radio, when oh. music meant something. Oh, uh, radio. <laughs> Bring back Silver Chair. <laughs> Nobody remembers when uh, Vanessa the Warren. crash test dummies, the oh, dummy the testers testing. were on the radio. Uh, Here's the thing. The dummy testers are great. Yeah, the dummy testers are great. <laughs> Crash <laughs> test dummies suck. Yeah. Yeah. That's facts. Got it. It's no time in music was as good as whenever Lou Bega was gracing the airwaves. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
Who's Lou Bega? <laughs> Mama what? number five. Oh, One, yeah. Two, three, three four, four, five. Everybody's out there. That is it all the time. <laughs> That's all we need. That's all it is. Those are all the comments. It's yep. good stuff. Yeah. yeah, you're probably right. So you can ask something. No, don't. Oh no, I was gonna. <laughs> no, don't. I was gonna don't go. do it. Yeah, Lou Gossett Jr. <laughs> Yes. Yes. We'll move on to But that. also, could you imagine that, Mambo? <laughs> oh, gosh. So, uh, stop the presses. Wait, no. Fuck. That's a, that's a, that's a different story. Wow. You messed it up. But also, stop the presses. Get your taste buds primed. Dunkaroos are coming back. Woo. Woo. In 2020, Dunkaroos are going to return to store shelves in yeah. the summer of 2020, General Mills recently announced. Hang on a second. Dunkaroos, motherfucker. You, you're looking like you don't give a shit. I couldn't. I, and you don't know what Dunkaroos are. No, and I'm the, the oldest is guy so here. Familiar, and, and I'm, I'm kind like, of excited. Is it donut related? I'm I've oh, never had a Dunkaroo God. in my life. Because you're for, too young. I'm yeah. forgetting what it is. What and is also, it? I've seen the ads for it, and it doesn't look good. Dunkaroos are great. It's what just, is it? are fucking awesome. Uh, cookies with icing that you can dip. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? Those are great. Bring them back. They have Oreos, cookies with icing in them already. It's different it's than different. Oreos. It's <laughs> different. You see this guy. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, so Dunkaroos were a hugely popular snack in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And then Michelle Obama came around. Damn. Hey. Wow. And said, Queen. No, no, no. No more sugar in these children's I mean, foods. They're way Hold on a minute. Time. We're not talking bad about Michelle I mean, Obama. oh, yes, of course. Like, she <laughs> she was 100% right. Gotcha. Yes. Uh, the Bring back trans fat. The shit that we ate whenever I was Hello? a kid was <laughs> fucking. I, I think back on it, and I'm just like, what the fuck was wrong with everybody? Nothing. Why did my came out fine. Why did my parents let me eat that shit? Yeah. But it was great when it happened. Oh, yeah, man. And I, I, I was eating Dunkaroos. Like, I think my generation was kind of spoiled with the rotten food and the and the bad shit for us. Because like, I, I grew up with eating so many things that were just bad for me. Nothing that's bad for me sounds like it's interesting anymore. Like Dunkaroos just sound like Oreos that I could probably buy icing for myself. How did but you? It's not, it's not. It doesn't taste anything like that. It doesn't it, taste it, like it. It, it looked like it had sprinkles, which makes me think it tastes like birthday cake. That's a fair assessment. Which is even worse because birthday cake is the worst kind of flavor. Take you take two <coughs> sugar cookies, uh -huh. and that it's not it's things. not the Oreo filling. It's no, like sure. frosting, like frosting. Sure. Yeah. So I'm I have to first of all make my own cookie. <laughs> <laughs> no. And secondly, it's not even a flavor that I like. So the problem what is, is this the weird. It, what are you? Why are you railing on this? Like I did this? it. Like, <laughs> she this asked like, me. He asked me. He said, "You have a look on your face like you don't give a fuck." I'm explaining. It's like uh, even if they brought back like. What's something they've taken away? Those those mm -hmm. al Altoids uh, that were like a fruit sour, shaped, yeah, yeah. sour Altoids. Delicious. Like that's cool, but again, I've eaten all this shit growing. Like I, I wasn't like a kid that was given candy once every now and again, and it was like such an amazing event that I that I wanted more. I had enough candy as a kid that now it's just like Dunkaroos. It's just more candy. I'm not gonna buy. I challenge you to think that. You ate worse than me as a child. Yeah, I don't. I, I, one hundred percent. Everything that Kirk is child. as a person now is a rebuke of <laughs> no. the way Basically, he lived as a child. No. I mm. ate candy cigarettes, and they were good. You, I, I, I mean, I also ate candy cigarettes. Did you yeah. eat candy cigarettes? Absolutely, Lucky they Brand had, too. Yeah, they, they, had, they had them in the night. They still have them now. You go to Kitchen Twenty Four, they, oh, they sell them in their. In their uh, I thought they banned thing. them. No, they're still they're still around. Oh. They're just they just don't look like them anymore. There's like no red tip and no no thing it on the back. Doesn't blow a little. Okay. And they're not chalky. Either. They're they're all uh, bubble gum now. And they're also like it's called disgusting. like candy sticks. Yeah, or candy sticks. Oh, okay, but um, they're still in packaging. Yeah, yeah. Dunk Roos are great, but I also I will say you know even before these come out on store Australia, like you know to get the full package and get the container and like the little thing and the little character on it or whatever, like the full experience, the full nostalgic experience, sure, but. Uh, if you want to have exactly what Dunkaroos are, you just get a sugar cookie and dip it in cake frosting. Yeah. That's just literally what it is. You don't need to really buy the my uh, my my friend branding. my friend Brandon used to eat that and he called it Porios. <laughs> I like that a lot more than anything else. What? Porios. Oh, I get it. I that's that's genius. Yeah. That's genius. And no, it no, tastes no, exactly like Dunkaroos. Yeah. But it's still cool that they're bringing them back. I think that's cool. Hey, let me ask you a question. Yeah, Since yeah. you ain't like making your own cookie, did you eat <laughs> Lunchables? Uh, I did, but not in the way that most people did it. You just ate all what of What does like, that mean? Pretty much he took a stack of crackers, ate it, it all your at butt once. or something? No, and then he took a stack of the cheese and ate it all at once and a stack of the whatever below yeah, I wouldn't, whatever. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like make things out. Of, I would just eat it all differently, like in little sections. 
Man. That's something wrong with you, though. That's, you gotta go to therapy. That's something I've been raging against wrong. this corporate machine for my entire life, man. So your rage against the corporate machine is to eat Lunchables in if a I'm, different way. If I'm spending money on something that somebody else is supposed to make, they're gonna goddamn it. make it for then me. Then why not just not eat the Lunchables and make a real? Sandwich? I didn't buy them. I didn't buy any of them. Okay. <laughs> my parents were buying them for me. That was it. Was, it was fun though? It wasn't making you. It was it was a fun activity. My school, like I always, kid. the only one I ever wanted was the pizza one, and my school. The pizza one sucked. No, the pizza one was my favorite, and they it never was terrible. They never let us use the microwave to heat it up. The pizza one fucking sucked. The only one that it was, was a, worth it was a big cracker with fucking marinara yeah, sauce on it. Crap. It was disgusting. And, and, and pepperonis and cheese. And <laughs> oh, 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 the only one, oh, the only one you didn't was, think about that, exactly. did you, Andrew? Uh, the only one worth buying was the nacho <laughs> one because it, it was just nachos already prepackaged. This is the content you know they come you here just, for. You mostly just had to dip for yourself, and I didn't even like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> <laughs> Yo, Tyler <laughs> hates work. <laughs> yeah. well. So uh, keeping this snack train rolling, they're Four also going to release Lucky Charms ice cream. No, they can no I'm not here for that. They can keep that. Lucky Charms ice cream no. is fucking amazing. So that. there's there's the? there's a, there's a there's a uh, there's an ice cream parlor here in Los Angeles called Salt and Straw, mm. and owned by Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Are you what? serious? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> he's, part, he's partner in it. That's so hilarious. that man got money everywhere. So every month, the Salt and Straws thing. I mean, they have great ice cream mm -hmm. and they have the regular flavors, but ev their their gimmick is every month they have a custom flavor menu, and the the flavors are like usually uh, they work with like children's organizations, and the kids like come up with ideas for flavors and then they make those. And so the first time I ever had Salt and Straw, their custom uh, flavor menu was this menu that was created by a bunch of kids and they interpreted it. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Lucky Charms ice cream. And it was the best ice cream I've ever had. Damn and then like, I thought it was like a regular flavor at mm -hmm. the place. Cause it looks like vanilla ice cream. It's milk, it's cereal milk flavored ice cream. And then uh, the the marshmallows, and oh, so, so they top it. It's hard. No, it's no, it's got the it's got the marshmallows in it, and it's cereal milk flavored ice cream. Yeah, this is none of this is good. And it's, it's and it sounds it's, like a bag of. It's salad. so good. It's you guys don't even know because you've never it. had it. It's it. so good. Not you guys just are just, idea, you guys are you guys are speaking at the level of prince of pure ignorance. <laughs> no, I'm um, saying it sounds nasty, but it is. Delicious. Nah, you told me. Um, the idea that, that so I but anyway, I, I went back the next time and I, I went to get it and I realized that I I found out that it was just a temporary menu and they didn't have it anymore and I was like, fuck. You shot it up. Yeah, I. The, the, <laughs> Jesus. Uh, so I'm so excited about this because I had it one time and it was delicious and it's been my white whale ever since. And uh, now you're just gonna be able to get it in stores. None of his. Wait, let me diverse. say a couple of things. Yeah, a couple of things. <laughs> It's probably not going to be as good I in the store say Black Whale. as it oh, is. Oh yeah, yeah it'll, it'll be lesser. It'll be yeah, it'll definitely be lesser. Yeah. but it'll still be something along the lines. <laughs> and then this is, this is just my opinion, but I feel that it's not as good as actual Lucky Charm <laughs> because you're missing out on a little bit of the the actual like cereal part to combine it. With oh, the I'm sure it's in there. I'm sure it's is not the just, cereal sure it's in not there. Just yeah, the cereal oh, was the in there. In the, there. Well, the marshmallow was in there, and then like the 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 ice cream somehow captures that flavor of the milk in a bowl of cereal. Oh, I'll tell you how. The guys that are making it are just eating bowls of cereal and recycling their milk into the uh, oh, okay, ice yeah. cream. That's nice. I would too. I would eat it if you melted the ice cream down, turned it into milk, put it in a bowl. Your 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 you opinion, your opinion on this doesn't matter because you don't like ice cream. That's, so it's like also oh, ice cream gives a yeah. fuck about. Nah, Turk, and I'm on insane. Andrew's side now. Ice cream yeah. is great. The cereal part of Lucky Charms tastes like fucking cardboard. <laughs> Not if you eat it with the marshmallow at the same time, and then you get a texture thing, and That's then you facts. still get the sweetness. I'm of here the to say, That's if facts. you like ice cream and if you like Lucky Charms. <laughs> this Lucky, Lucky Charms ice cream is fucking amazing, and this I'm not, not and, I, and I'm not, I can't guarantee that this will be at the level <laughs> of this ice cream flavor that was created at some, you know, relatively small ice cream parlor in the Los Angeles. That's yeah, an artisanal area like ice cream shop, not but the concept of it is great. So that'll be uh, available <clears throat> sometime this year. Does it say who the brand is? Uh, it's Nestle, and oh. they're they're also releasing this alongside cinnamon toast crunch flavored ice cream. Wow! 
which I which will probably be good too. I used to love cinnamon toast crunch. Trail of sugar at the very end. Yeah, man. My Drink goodness. that milk. Yeah. So this is <clears throat> this is a new story milk. that just happened, and I'm so excited. You just can't hide I'm it. I'm so excited. I'm so control. excited. What do you prefer so to sing in or bang? Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> no. I don't have enough no. of my water out of this for the real residents to happen. It's There's Austin. too much water. I would there. like everybody in this room to do a Bane impersonation. It's Austin Steve Powers Steve. again. Yes. <clears throat> I got feedback from two separate people saying that you guys are insane and my Bane impression was solid. I mean, I'm it's sure one kids. was your friend and Sick one was offense. your wife. Yeah. <laughs> Sick offense, I tell it you. Was, it was a friend who <laughs> would who literally I wrote a script and I showed it to him and he was like, this sucks. This is garbage. Yeah, but it's still a friend. <clears throat> it's a friend. <laughs> it's a friend who is like, who was overly honest about something to a degree where I was actually offended by it. Did he like your Austin Powers? <laughs> That's not a thing. Okay, then he then he heard it wrong. I sent you a video of Bane's speaking voice. I mean, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? Yeah, you know what I mean? yeah and it sounded like that. Nah, man. It right. did. <laughs> Tell me what you're excited about, King. <laughs> so, uh, stop the presses. Oh, boy. And hail to the King, baby. Because Satan. just announced... Sam Raimi is going to be directing Doctor Strange 2. So initially, the movie, which is Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, was being directed by Scott Derrickson, who was the director of the first Doctor Strange. And he comes from a lineage of being a horror director. So he directed Sinister and uh, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Oh. So he directed Doctor Strange. And the whole high concept of, of Doctor Strange 2 in the Multiverse of Madness that they've been talking about for like over a year at this point, is that it's going to be a horror movie. They've been building up to this. They have they have a script. They've been in pre-production. And the whole thing is it's going to be a Marvel MCU horror film. But just recently, due to creative differences, Scott Derrickson has left the project, and now uh, Sam Raimi is going to be directing it. Sam Raimi <laughs> is, uh, is a, is a writer-director. He directed Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness. He directed uh, Darkman. Starring Liam Neeson. And he also directed the Spider-Man movies. So Spider-Man 1, 2, and 3 with Tobey Maguire. The good ones. So he has yeah. three. He has the combination of experience directing these really like schlocky <laughs> horror movies as well as the experience like basically directing the superhero movies that kind of arguably started it all alongside the X-Men movies. I'm so excited for this. I love this. I think <clears throat> this is a not a fan of horror, but a great, cool, innovative idea. Mm. Here's my question. Do you think what well, we know because yeah. it's a big property, it's going to be <clears throat> slick? But wouldn't you love it if it was kind of schlocky, like early Sam Raimi? Well, I mean, the Spider Man movies were okay. Like, if you go back and watch the Spider Man movies, are you not saying that based on just like <clears throat> because that's in, yeah, because of time, so much time has gone. No, past? I think, I think, uh, I don't, I don't think like when you, when you watch, at least when I watched them when I was younger, I didn't really mm -hmm. pick up on it. But if you go back and watch the Sam Raimi Spider Man movies, they're like super schlocky. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what that means to you? Campy, oh, okay. like like a like a low budget horror the, movie. Okay. The mm. moment I remember most of the of Spider the first Spider Man was uh, when Green Goblin is sp spoilers guys. <laughs> Green Goblin is attacking the parade and he's above Spider Man and Spider Man like puts his arm into the flyer and his arm goes from this length to like from here to the ceiling and it's all extended too. It looks like he's like. Uh, Mr. Fantastic mm -hmm. and stretching his arm up that way, and that's all I can remember from that movie. <laughs> well, I'm not even talking about that stuff. But I'm like, like for instance, like uh, Willem Dafoe, his performance as yeah. Green oh. Goblin is so ah ha ha ha, Spider Man. Like that. he's got such an over the top, schlocky mm. B movie performance. Uh, those movies were basically just like B genre <laughs> movies with like a hundred million dollar budgets. That's why it'd be interesting if that's what. Doctor Strange 2 is going to be because mm -hmm. Doctor Strange 1 I didn't get that feeling for that but if it turns like let's make it like Dark Man yeah that's what I yeah. said whenever my friend told me about this I was like I can't wait for a Doctor Strange movie with the tone of Dark Man that would be crazy I haven't seen Dark Man what is it it's way schlocky but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty just darn a, it's good it's just a signature uh, Sam Raimi movie what's the just, uh, Sam Dark Raimi's Man. Sam Raimi's movies are like they're <laughs> horror but they have this like goofy comedic tone to them that's just really interesting What's the uh, what's the over under on seeing Tobey Maguire? Zero percent. Zero percent at all. We're not gonna we're not gonna enter that universe at <laughs> no. all. In a in a. I'm not even sure if Bruce Campbell will be in it Ooh, because he's always he in always every in like it? Sam Raimi movie. But 
he's kind of I don't I, I don't even know if that'll happen. Damn, yeah, I was kind of bigger than Sam Raimi. At his input, if you, mm. if you know what I'm saying. Well, exactly. I mean, but he, you know, Bruce Campbell was in all three Spider-Man movies. But who was he I in just, the third? That's one? like such a. He was a train goer. I forget. That's, that's, he in one of them, he was just a guy in an elevator. Yeah. Oh, the waiter. Yeah, 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 waiter. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. I love it. He was like in the first one. He was like the promoter for the wrestle, the amateur oh, yeah. wrestling. Ooh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thank you for my new uh, mm. my new theory. He is the watcher in those three movies. <laughs> that's just the Stan Lee theory that, that already exists. Yeah, but fuck that theory. Stan Lee's a piece of shit. <laughs> I'd rather I'd rather be uh, Bruce Campbell. Okay. <laughs> Who is Glenn Campbell? Why is that? Right. Glenn Campbell, the singer. <laughs> yeah, the singer. I'd rather the be Glenn singer? Campbell. Glenn Campbell. I am a lineman for <laughs> That's the county, what it... yes. and I walk the main road. Thank you. All right, moving on. <laughs> and I need you more nah, than want on. you. Move on. <laughs> and I want you for Goodness. all time. The Wichita lineman mm. is still on the line. <laughs> No, it's not good music. It's not good at all. How dare the you? It's great music. Patty yeah. the Bell wouldn't like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure she loves it. She probably does. Absolutely. Absolutely. She probably does. Because she LaBelle? has taste. Queen LaBelle? No, P. <clears throat> P. LaBelle. <laughs> so excited for it. Oh, if she I don't know. I didn't watch the first. The first Doctor Strange Doctor was Strange. okay. It was fine. It, was enjoyable. it, didn't, intra- it didn't attract me, but seeing his character in the uh, in the other movies, I would be interested to see, because he's such a kind of slick character. That I don't know how Sam Raimi could make him this like thing. If you know I what mean, I mean, what Doctor Strange is combined with Sam Raimi's sensibility would be the platonic ideal of what doc of a Doctor Strange movie. Hmm, like really? he was born to make a Doctor Strange movie. Really? I love okay. It. I can't wait to see it. I'm excited. So this is crazy, and also it ties into we've talked about this several times across this show. I feel. In an unprecedented piece of news that nobody saw coming, Rick Moranis may be coming out of retirement for a Honey, I Shrunk the Kid reboot. That's nuts. That is crazy. Do you think it's because everybody's like been trying to do that? Or do you think he's just like, do you think he's the type of person that goes, it's my time, I'm ready to come back? Or do you think it's like everybody is kind of in the same mindset of, we miss Rick Moranis. Everybody talks about him every now and again. I'm sure he hears from people that really want him to come back. It's probably some combination of the two. Yeah, I would agree. And also 66. maybe looking at his bank account going, I, I can stand to do another. I can stand I Yeah, I can do it. Fun. Yeah, just I for think fun. He, I think he got a couple kids that are like, yeah, dad, his college loan. How long, do we, how long do we have until the Ghostbusters movies come out? Can you can we get him in, in there real quick? I mean, I find it well, really interesting no that he said oh, no. He did it's say really no. interesting oh, okay. that he's straight up no to Ghostbusters. But for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, he's like, yeah, let me talk about it. That's very interesting. Disney. Disney money. Disney. No, so, Ghostbusters got the bad. Rick Moranis is reportedly in talks with Disney to join the Honey, I Shrunk the Kids reboot called Sh- called Shrunk. Ugh. It's them just Shrunk? in family counseling. I didn't even notice that whenever so I wrote just this. Fucked. Yeah. Moranis has largely been out of the spotlight since the late 1990s. He has taken on voice roles along with, SE, with SETV uh, reunions, but he hasn't starred in a live action movie in over 20 years. Moranis family famously starred in Ghostbusters and has been asked to take part in the reboot along with the upco- upcoming Ghostbusters Afterlife, but he declined every time, stating that he isn't interested in revisiting the past. It appears Rick Moranis might have a bigger soft spot for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids than he does for the Ghostbusters franchise. According to sources, the actor is in talks to reprise the role of Wayne Zielinski, a scientist who accidentally shrinks his and two neighboring kids. He will reportedly star alongside Josh Gad, who will pl- be playing Zelinsky's adult son, Nick. The I reboot mean, is titled Shrunk and is being l- called a <clears throat> legacy sequel. Ooh. I don't like that. That branding is Just the word awful. is fucking terrible. Shame on that legacy. PR yeah, yeah, person. Yeah, 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 that's, yeah. A power, yeah, yeah. that's a power word right That Which means it will exist legacy. in the same world and continue the overall storyline. I hope they bring back Eve Gordon. Eve Gordon? Yeah, she was in Honey, We Shrunk, Shrunk Ourselves, which I think... Uh, our generation wise uh-huh. was the bigger um, How We Shrunk Ourselves movie. Is that the one with like the the Shrunk chili the volcano a scene? I think it's the one where they're like potassium. How do you? Yes, like... it is the one with the chili volcano. Yes. Yeah, then yeah, yeah. That it's is a... that is the more famous one because they like ride bubbles or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. a good. That's a good one. Right. I think that's the only like I remember both equally with. Uh, I remember that one some, for some reason more. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, there's there's Honey I Shrunk the Kids and then Honey I Blew Up the Kids. I haven't I don't seen. Know that one. Honey I Blew Up the Kid. 
Oh, the kid. That's just, right. Just one kid. Is that like a kid. straight to DVD one or something? No, was, no, that was in theaters. The, oh. honey, honey, we shrunk ourselves with the straight DVD one. Oh, yeah. 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 Wow. Weird. That is weird. He might be coming to this this reboot. Nice. Yeah, that check. Is um, nice. which will be which will be crazy. Also, Josh Gad's hilarious. Where's Josh Gad been, man? Hasn't he been doing Being the voice of Olaf in Frozen? That and uh, he's yeah, been okay. doing stage, hasn't he? I thought he was. <laughs> uh, I thought he was. Not really. I mean, he was the he was the, in the original Broadway recording of or Broadway cast of uh, Book of Mormon. Book of Mormon, but that was a long time ago. That was it. I thought he did some. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, he's done other stuff, but yeah. like I think he his Broadway oh, okay. chunk Thanks. has already kind of come and gone. Gotcha. Mm. He's like he's now he's trying to get back into movies. I, I mean, I hope <clears throat> good things for Josh Gad. Yeah. So uh, there's also a a live action Lilo and Stitch remake. No, they can keep that. Heading straight to <laughs> Disney Plus. Mindset. Oh, yeah. I'm a, I'm a family. How the hell, Lilo and family? Stitch? Wow. Nobody gets left behind. That was not bad. I that do was this a... for my son. Now, the more you do it, the worse it is. Who plays... Sometimes my son doesn't even want to talk to me unless I'm a character. Oh, oh man. He'll just, he, when I talk to him, he'll ignore me. Damn. But then whenever I talk to him as Stitch, then he suddenly wants to talk to me. Can you do Plinkly? I mean, that was a great Bane. <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> Sometimes I'll be Tigger and I'll sing the Tigger thong. The wonderful thing about Tigger is Tigger's a wonderful thing. The tops are made out of rubber, the bottoms are made out of springs. Nice the bouncy, flouncy, bouncy, flouncy, fun, for fun, for fun. But the most wonderful yeah. thing about Tigger is I'm the only one. And then sometimes he wants me to do that song as other characters. So <laughs> the wonderful Sing thing the about this is this is the wonderful things. The tops are made out of rubber. The bottoms are made out of springs. The bouncy, fancy, bouncy, fancy, fun, for fun, for fun. But the most wonderful thing about this is I'm the only one. Mm. I'm the only one. Oh, Hannah. Damn. Six yeah, hundred. Eight. <laughs> and then also, Five. the wonderful thing about like Kermit's oh. is Kermit's are wonderful oh, things. Wow, we had Their to tops going. made out of rubber. Yeah. Their bottoms wow. made out of springs. Nah, They're bouncy, right. bouncy, 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 fun, for fun, for fun. That's it right but the there. most wonderful thing about Kermit's is I'm the only one. Right. I'm the only one. Yay! Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy right there. All right. Who else? Who else? Who else? Uh, Sean, right, Con- so Sean Connery. Sean Connery. No, 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 no. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. Uh, no, so, no, don't no, do it. No, 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 the wonderful thing oh about Bane is Bane's a wonderful thing. We are losing subscribers. Gaining subscribers. Crazy. All right, so Lilo and Stitch. Yeah, Lilo and Stitch live action. You think they're gonna put a costume on a dog? It's gonna be. It's gonna be snow. <laughs> it's gonna. Be- that literally never works. Every single movie from the '80s and '90s that has a little monster character in it literally starts with the story of like we tried to just put a costume on a monkey. And he freaked out, and then we built a puppet. Because he's a monkey. That's like literally every every movie starts with that story. But yeah. uh, it's gonna be all. It's gonna be a CGI character. Yeah, we don't it's the thing. Why like, don't they just make another like one that's three three D, like Minions, the way that looks, or something like that. That'd because be live action is the fad now. Stupid. But again, as we've said, it's not Stop. live action. Yeah, it's it's not. I mean, well, I there's no such thing. It's gonna be all real Stitched. people. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I guess this one will be. The outpouring of live action remakes from Disney will continue as the updated version of Lilo and Stitch is reporting to he- reportedly heading to Disney Plus with plans to start shooting this year. Oh, okay. Joining many animated Disney movies to come before it. The rebooted Lilo and Stitch is described as a live action CGI hybrid project, oh, okay. suggesting we'll likely see an animated Stitch living in Lilo's real world. Word of the planned remake dates back to 2018 when the project was first announced, though updates on this progress uh, have been rather stagnant ever since. The original voice actor, Chris Sanders, who played uh, Stitch, is expected to return and shooting in Hawaii for a 2021 release. Do you feel like, I, I mean, now it, now that you say it's going to Disney+, Plus, it kind of makes more sense to me. But yeah. do you feel like this is something that would have worked in 2005? A live action version? Yeah, because I feel like around that time there when did was this come out. I mean, it came out. That, the, yeah, the the action movie came out around that time. But okay. like, did it? like I could see this being a thing ten years ago. I don't. I don't. I like Flubber type of thing. You know? <sighs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, Flubber was ninety nine, but like, yeah, seems kind of like old. But I guess that's the point. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was there there have been like cycles of. It's two thousand two. Oh, yeah, they're wow. gonna like. My, my worry is that they're gonna replace the. I, so I just fast. wanted to, if they're gonna do it, do a complete shot for shot remake of it and just make it live action because what am I? It's be kind of a it perfect a movie concept. though. It's it's hilarious. There's nothing really wrong with it. It's not insensitive in any way. Well, like that's Disney funny movie. that you say that because oh no, uh, <laughs> goddamn. There was a uh, Lilo's <laughs> racist. Lilo's <laughs> racist. <laughs> well, no. I, so so originally and there was a there was a scene at the end of the movie where they are trying to capture Stitch. The, like calling in Wranglers or whatever, 
And so they hijack a plane and are chasing him in an airplane. Fuck. And then like the plane crashes in the city. That was what the how the movie ended. And then uh literally during like when the movie was almost done, 9-11 happened. Fuck. So they they took it and they changed it to be a spaceship. Yeah. And then they made it where it didn't destroy the city. Yeah. Damn. Yeah, I, I mean I don't There's uh a reason these things happen. I don't feel any way about that. Uh, yeah, because I mean, I, I was never even my my brother loves Lilo and Stitch, but I never cared for it. That's cool. I I was fine with it. it I was, enjoyed it when it came out, and then never needed to see it again. It's a great yeah, movie. I don't think I ever watched. it. Yeah, I remember seeing it was great, but I was not like, hey, let's check it out again. But I bet you this looks really good. I bet the you by punch now. Punch. They've yeah. they've perfected. Let me not say that because Lion uh, King was super <laughs> garbage, and Al- Aladdin was sort of garbage. So Aladdin was sort of garbage. Yeah. The one thing I do think though about is like. Because when Moana came out, they were just like, oh, like the first Disney princess that's like a Pacific Islander or whatever. And I'm just like, what are you talking about? Lilo and Stitch. Yeah. 2002. I mean, no, she's not a princess. That, that's that's like the thing. It's just if you're a she's, girl. I mean, she might as well be. She might as well be a princess. But what's her name is actually a princess. Moana is a princess. Isn't she a god? I, I didn't. I'm gonna be honest. I didn't see Moana. <laughs> she's, she's like, like she's like a god. She's the daughter she? of the village chief. She is descended from voyagers hey, question who made their way Dear across the world. Two sons Still, watch they Moana? call me. My infant son doesn't watch TV. Oh. You're yeah. not supposed to watch until you're two years old. It'd have to be based It'll fuck up outside your of mind. Continental really? USA, because she'd be thrown in like an asylum for saying that the water speaks to her. But does the older one watch Moana? It's his favorite movie. Really? Oh. oh is it because just... It's the first movie he ever saw. Is it just because of Moana. Shiny? <laughs> he loves wow. Shiny, the song Shiny so much. He loves all the songs, particularly shiny. You're Welcome. Oh. When people are tired of your singing, do you still feel compelled to sing? That's never happened. People don't get tired of his singing, man. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I'm just curious. I'm just wondering if it's a thing of like... You're like you have to keep going. I it only it. fuels me up. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what I'm yeah, saying. That. That's I'm what makes you a great it. background singer. Keep going, Ooh. kid. Honestly, I could go on and on. I could explain every natural phenomenon: the sky, the grass, the clouds. Oh, that was Maui just messing around. I killed a Neil and I buried its guts. Drowned in a decree. Now you have coconuts. It's What's the lesson? Eminem what is the takeaway? Don't mess with Maui when he's on his breakaway. And the tapestry We're here in my skin sued. is the tap. Is the what is this? I haven't. I don't know. I thought he was freestyling. It's, you're welcome. From <laughs> I thought he was freestyling. I, I can't remember. Uh, it's good. Can you do? Can you do? Uh, no, this okay. is not the Andrew Variety. Can I do? You What's were doing the fast story? Traffic, so I was doing. I was going to ask for Eminem's Godzilla. No, I mean I haven't even heard it. You haven't? No, oh, that's great. Sick. But I can go nowadays. Everybody want to talk like they got something to say, but nothing comes out when they move the lips. Just a bunch of gibberish. You motherfuckers act like you forgot about Dre. So there's a live action One Piece series based on the manga ordered by Netflix. Yeah, but you're a racist, dude. Yeah. Netflix has greenlit One Piece, a live action series based on the best selling manga title of all time. Uh, the ten episodes, yes, that's true. That it's the One best. Piece is the most popular manga ever made, but it's a such a trash it. show. It's not a trash show. It's, it's a great garbage. show. It's no, it's dumb. not. It's definitely <laughs> not. Have we so talked dumb. about One Piece before? Yeah, we, yeah, we, we played. Okay, yeah. we played a little piece. That's One why. One Piece is the most. It 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 outsold. It's it's outsold Naruto and Dragon Ball Z. Um, How do you is this the that? same thing as Mixed One Punch Man? <laughs> and it's not. It's not trash. The, it's it's good. different than One Punch Man. Yeah. Oh, different. Wow, <laughs> that was thinking, I was right there with you. Okay, I thought it was the yeah. same. One same piece thing. is about mindset. <laughs> Monkey T. Luffy, who's a pirate who eats uh, gum gum, and he is able to. He basically has like stretchy arms, and he's like, Mr. and he can Fantastic. make his fist huge oh, okay. and fight people. And uh, in in his search to find the One Piece, which is a uh, treasure, the highest selling manga <laughs> of all time, and uh, there is a <clears throat> an an anime that has been running alongside it since the nineties. And basically how manga works is like manga basically never ends. I mean, some of them do, mm-hmm. but like basically they'll manga is, is published like a chapter at a time in magazines in Japan. So there's different, there's like shonen magazines, which is for like teenage boys, shoujo magazine, which is for teenage girls and uh, other age ranges. Every media is all classified by age ranges in Japan. So it's like, here's the stuff for teenage boys. Here's the stuff for teenage girls. Here's the stuff for adult ma- males. Here's the stuff for uh, like ch- child boys and and child girls and so uh one piece is a is a show is a shonen uh manga and it's published monthly in uh the most popular uh magazine in japan shonen jump 
and it's been running consistently since the 90s. So, like, from whenever it started in the 90s, it's still being published today. Every single month? Every single month. Oh, wow. uh, and so, wow. like, manga like that basically never ends. Like, to- JoJo's Bizarre Adventure has been uh, running since the early 80s, and it's still running. And they just keep continuing the story. Wait, wow. Shows and Jump is a physical television channel basically you no, have to, shonen you, jump you is get a, it shonen is a magazine yeah but you get a you get a uh, a chapter from each one every every month yeah so so you're basically tuning into an episode every month yeah that's insane to me yeah, How yeah. Long but you can it? buy the books complete yeah and then okay, they, they release them in in the trade manga gotcha books. that's that's dedication if you so wait a month to read 17 different stories like 17 a magazine can hold up to however many different stories inside of it and you oh, wait you wait for a different it. chapter every month so you have a bunch of it so the chapter is like how many pages would you say uh i'm not sure what the what the chapter i, I don't know have have a page length off the top of my head right now but uh you know it'd be like whatever 10 pages or whatever it is um, and it's a physical magazine yeah wow and not only that, like the book is a complete story. So they've completed many stories and then they've just moved on to the next thing. They just like, they like, you know, like in Dragon Ball Z, like yeah. the Frieza saga, the Cell saga, like mm-hmm. that's like an arc. So okay. you, you go through and you do the whole Frieza saga and then that's over. And then you just start a new storyline. Got it. She's a loop. Um, yeah. Shout out to One Piece. One Piece yeah. So that, so that's been running. The manga has been running. Uh, and then there's a anime show that's produced alongside it. The anime just basically runs a little bit behind the manga so they can sort of like wait for the next storyline and then catch mm-hmm. up or whatever. It's crazy that this is so big because I know what Naruto is. I know what Dragon Ball Z is. I know what uh, One Punch Man is. Right. I mean, I don't know what they are, but I know what they are. <laughs> you know the names. And, yeah. and I know what Death Note is. And then you're going to say this is the biggest one ever. And I never, like, yeah. I thought it was One well, Punch Man. Well, it's like, man. number one, the the popularity of it in the, in the West, in the United States, has waned since mm. like the early 2000s. Uh. And and number two, even even whenever it was big, you know, we the, the things that appeal to Japanese audiences don't necessarily cross over to appealing to Western audiences. But it, yeah, but it is the highest selling, most popular manga in Japan. And they're doing a they're doing a live action ten episode show for Netflix. It's a partnership between Tomorrow Studios and Netflix, and uh, it has. Uh, Steven Maida, who's written for Lost and the X-Files as a writer, showrunner, and executive producer. And then Matt Owens, writer from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Luke Cage as a writer and executive mm-hmm. producer. And uh, yeah, they're gonna be, there's going to be 10 episodes developed how, for Netflix. How does that work? I mean, okay, so there's source material. There's material made from the source material. And then there's this going to be made from the same source material or from the TV show? Are we just going to follow no, well, it in a live I mean, the TV manner? show, the, 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 uh, the anime is basically like, I mean, it depends on the it depends on the studio that makes it. Like, usually they try to make the anime just like shot for shot, identical to the manga. Mm-hmm. There's been some notable uh, discrepancies, like the first version of, of Full Metal Alchemist, because they were making the show alongside the manga being produced. Like mm-hmm. at a certain point, when they mm-hmm. caught up to the manga, they had to like diverge. So like the first the first ver- the 2003 version of Full Metal Alchemist, like it's similar up to a certain point and then it completely moves away and the storyline from the show is totally different from the, than the manga. Uh-huh. And then they ended up later on, they did Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, which is basically a more accurate, faithful adaptation of the manga. So there's like two different versions of Full Metal Alchemist and one of them is just like more similar to the manga. Mm. So this is going to be based on the manga. The, the anime is nearly identical to the manga other than the fact that they always have like filler episodes mm. uh because they're like waiting for the manga to to move forward a lot of times like in Dragon Ball Z most notoriously or most infamously there's an episode of Dragon Ball Z where Piccolo learns how to drive which is just like a hilarious concept for an episode it's like literally just Piccolo like wears like regular clothes and he just get takes a driving test that was not in the manga. It was a filler episode that they they just did that because they were waiting for the manga to come out so that they could, you know, move on with it. So, you know, this this show would basically be adapting the manga without any of the filler, uh, but it'd be live action. Okay. Basically what this is is uh, Netflix is making a big push now because Disney Plus came out and Disney is, like, basically taking back all of their Disney stuff off of Netflix. And a lot of people are coming out with their own streaming services. So, like, Netflix is basically losing the ability to have stuff like The Office or mm-hmm. Friends or any of the Marvel movies. Like, they're losing their licensing for, like, a lot of the popular stuff that people are into. So they're making a huge push to get anime. 
So if you've noticed that like there's a shitload of anime on Netflix now, like that's basically their 2020 strategy, and it, a little bit bleeding back into into 2019 is to license as much anime stuff as possible. So they're trying to get Crunchyroll out of here. Yeah, man. It'd be interesting if because of Netflix reach that it becomes even a bigger thing. Like animation My, just blows mm-hmm. up even more just because it's so much on Netflix and people are like, well, I'll check this out. And then it just becomes even even I bigger mean, thing. They're spending $17 billion That's on new content. Crazy. That's nuts. So those anime um, guys are eating, hopefully. But a, a live action One Piece show could be fucking great. But also live action adaptations of manga are usually never good. Like they're I just yeah, they're it's... just like notoriously <laughs> never good. Mm. See like, Full Metal Alchemist and Death Note. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Netflix did Death Note Net- movie wasn't good. Netflix did a, a Full Metal Alchemist movie and then a, a Death Note movie. And the Full Metal Alchemist movie was a Japanese production. And then the next Netflix movie was basically like an American like adaptation of Death Note. And they both just kind of were disappointing and people didn't like them because you just you just can't quite capture the essence of an of an anime or a yeah. manga in a live action. It's yeah. like it's like you're painting with like four colors when you when in manga and anime you can use like a thousand colors just the limitations that you have with live action versus a cartoon where you can literally do anything that you want before we move on real quick the thing i do to remember from one piece is a lot of characters that look like sea creatures which is going to be fun to see in the live action version i think yeah they should have um you know who should work on that? The dude, the dude who did Life of Pi. Oh, Ang Lee. Ang Lee. Ooh, that's because he's such a visual guy. He I is, feel like it's gonna be too. That'd be too high concept. Like he'd really uh, make it about the visuals and not the content. And I don't think that's what a, uh, anime people want. Uh, might be. So recently, it's Black History Month. So let's give our props to those black inventors and entrepreneurs out there. Lonnie Johnson, the inventor of the Super Soaker. And his company were recently awarded seventy two point nine million dollars from Hasbro for missed royalty payments. Yeah. Wow. So back in the back in the eighties, Lonnie Johnson, who uh, he's he's a nuclear engineer. Uh, he has a PhD from Tuskegee University. A former NASA scientist, he founded his company in nineteen ninety nine, and it was the first year that he first licensed his invention, the Super Soaker, uh, to. to um, Laramie Corp for 200 million and Laramie Corp was later sold or purchased by Hasbro. So he licensed this back in the 80s and since then his company is called Johnson Research and De- Development Company and they've been in a in a royalty dispute with Hasbro since February when the company filed a claim against the giant toy company according to King and Spaulding which along with A Lee Bayer PC law firm represented Johnson Hasbro underpaid royalties for the Nerf line toys from 2007 to 2012. Oh, they all he all, he's licensed Super Soaker, Soaker and a and a bunch of different Nerf toys that he oh, inv- really? that he invented. And they were underpaying royalties from 2007 to 2012. And so he the company sued Hasbro in a separate breach of contract suit filed in the US District Court in Atlanta in February. Johnson accuses Hasbro of violating a 1996 agreement to pay him Super Soaker royalties of 2% for three-dimensional products based on the appearances of the toys and 1% for two-dimensional visual representations. So like anytime the Super Soaker is featured in like an ad or something in a catalog or something. The suit says that Hasbro sold water guns that were visually similar and based upon the appearance of Super, super Soaker water guns that incorporate Johnson's technology. Johnson also wanted the court to force Hasbro to open its books to determine sales of Super Soaker products from 2006 to 2012. So basically all of this they won and they got $80 million. That's amazing. Uh, and what Hasbro was doing was they were perf- – they, were, they, were, uh, they created and were selling Super Soaker-like water guns that just didn't have the Super Soaker name on them. But they were just basically Super Soakers. Yeah. And so Lonnie Johnson was like, that's still Super Soaker. Yeah. So pay me for all that shit. I wish Tyler was – not away because we recently had a conversation about you know like your property and the things that you invent and things that you create and um how other people will just take it and make money off of it and he was just like that should be fair and it's like no i mean he created this and and they pretty much stole his stuff and yeah tried to get away with it and he's owed that so give it to him yeah you know and this is a, not even give it to him pay the man you this know is a man? big win for black inventors and black entrepreneurs who have just no, notoriously been screwed ripped up, ripped off and screwed over uh by companies throughout history we talked about a, an example of this on the last episode 
of an African composer who wrote Lion Sleeps Tonight, and then mm-hmm. it was stolen by American rock bands in the 50s, and then uh, Disney used it in The Lion King, and then mm-hmm. they, the the family of the uh, composer was like, hey, our dad wrote this, and they it was stolen from him back in the 50s. Can you pay some royalties? And then Disney was like, fuck you. So that's, you know, that happens a lot. And this is a huge win for black creators mm-hmm. getting their, getting paid for their shit by big corporations. What I think is also really interesting is just the, the, the credits that you read off of this guy to create something what seems so simple as the super soaker, you know, but he's a, what did you say he was? A, a, he's he's a, like a nuclear engineer. Yeah, he's a nuclear engineer insane. with a PhD and he was a NASA scientist. Yeah. This guy's a genius. Yeah, he's brilliant. And brilliant. yeah, like, like he said, like he said, like I said, he invented the super soaker, that, yeah, that technology. Which we all had. We yeah. all had it. And it's like basically it's like nuts. the difference between a water gun and a super soaker is like the pressurized mm-hmm. uh, stream. So mm-hmm. a water gun, you like hit the trigger and like a little yeah. bit of a spray of water comes out. But a super soaker, you pump it up yeah. and then you can like fucking blast somebody from across he, the room. He made it better. Yeah. Yeah. Last story before we take a break. There is a Matilda, a, a Matilda musical remake happening at Netflix. So Roald Dahl's beloved 1988 novel Matilda is getting an all new live an all new movie adaptation from Netflix and Sony Pictures called Matilda the Musical. The movie will be directly based on the popular stage show version of the classic story which has been running in London since 2011. Uh, reportedly the plan is to first release the movie theatrically and on home video exclusively in the UK before then making it available to stream worldwide for subscribers on Netflix. Full details on the deal are still being worked out, and both Netflix and Sony have yet to officially comment on the project. Matthew Warchus, who has experience directing the stage show, will also be helming the new Matilda the Musical movie. Writing the screenplay will be Dennis Kelly, who won a Best Book of Musical Tony Award as the playwright of the original musical. And it is not clear if Tim Minchin, who wrote the music and lyrics for Matilda the Musical, will be returning to write and arrange the music for the the movie. Um, So yeah, there's going to be a Matilda movie Musical. For uh, Netflix, and it's a musical, and I guess it's based on a live musical stage musical. show that's been pretty popular yeah. in uh, London. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I, I I wasn't familiar with any of this. I didn't know that there was a musical. I didn't know anything about this. The only thing I do know, and which is very interesting to me, is I didn't know that Tim Minchin wrote the music and lyrics for this. Uh, he's uh, he's a very funny uh, comedian. No, uh, no, he's a stand-up comedian who does a lot of musical stuff integrated mm-hmm. with his shows. And he's great. And I, yeah, I didn't know that he did this. I just think it's fascinating how this, how it comes about of like, there's Matilda, there's Matilda, the story. Mm-hmm. It was a movie, then became a Broadway musical. Now it's coming back to movies as the Broadway musical. Right. And that's like a thing now, like that's what's happening with uh, Mean like Girls. Tester, okay. Yeah. Mean, mean Girls is coming, mean back, girls as is coming back as a musical. And I'm like, that's fascinating yeah. how they just it's, it's just constant content uh, yeah it's yeah. like it's weird it's like um hairspray exactly in, in the movie that that john waters directed the mom of the main character was played by divine yeah who's a drag queen yeah and so whenever it was adapted to uh the stage that role became relegated as like this is going to be played by a man dressed in drag mm-hmm. so like harvey firestein yeah. played that character for a while so then when they made the movie adaptation of the musical that was sort of like adopted mm-hmm. and it became part of the concept of, yeah. the, sh- of the of the show slash movie mm-hmm. that the main character's mom is played by a man dressed in drag and then John Travolta ended yeah. up playing that. So, 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 so it's funny enough content. that you bring that up because one of the major things going around with like places that are doing this off Broadway and stuff like that is Trunchbull is played by a man. Oh, really? And it's usually, that's how that's how every production is nowadays. And people are mad because a man is doing it and not like a trans oh. uh, man or anything like that. People are getting upset that men are playing women's roles. When, when a woman made it perfectly in the movies, they think that a woman should be playing it or somebody who identifies as a woman and is still transitioning or something. Well, that's what would happen if, if Hairspray came out today, the movie. That's it's it, The same controversy would be around that. Right. It, was, it was back in 2008 or whatever it was. So... Right. It was less, you know, we were just we were we were in a kind of a different time. Yeah, but if Hairspray came out now, there would be huge controversy over yeah. the fact that John Travolta was playing mm, the mom in, instead of an actual drag absolutely. queen. And that's what I'm wondering about Netflix. Netflix is bringing it back as a musical instead of remaking it as its original, which was so beloved. What are they going to do with that character? Are they going to hold true to the person who made the musical, who wants it to be a man playing the character, or are they going to have a uh, singing Miss Trunchbull that's a woman? 
Well, considering that the the director of the movie is going to be one one of the directors of the stage musical, and the writer of the screenplay is going to be the writer of the musical, I'm assuming that they're going to Culture. sort of want it assume, to be yeah. similar to what the. Do want to keep it to was. the Broadway I think show? So too. It's just. I think yeah. it's a great idea. Uh, I think Matilda is one of those movies you have to remake it for a new generation. Yeah, I think it's one of those because yeah. it's a little girl. The story is always going to be relevant mm -hmm. um and the fact that it's coming back as a musical i think is dipping into a whole different stream of success so i think it's a great idea yeah. right on I i'll watch it <clears throat> yeah i'm interested to see it just because it. i know uh, i mean the thing that excites me most about it is just that if the music in this movie is just basically based on the stage musical tim Minchin is hilarious and he makes funny stuff and he makes you know his the songs that he has in his show are really good and really funny so I would just be interested in seeing it for that alone. Cool. So we're going to take a quick break and we come back. We're going to watch the new Chris Rock Saw movie trailer. That's exciting. I'm so happy. With it. Be right back. And we're back. All right. So uh, a couple months ago, it was announced that uh, they were rebooting Saw with Chris Rock writing it. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a weird piece of news that everyone kind of didn't know what they felt about it. And now uh, we have a trailer for the movie. And interestingly enough, it's not called Saw. It's called Spiral. And it's from like it's Saw. like from the book of Saw. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's like a spin-off of oh. like in the Saw universe, I guess. I like okay. So, so it's not I, necessarily a remake. No, it's like how they made Cloverfield and then they had like 10 Cloverfield Lane, which was like Oh, oh and that's different. It's like it's oh, okay. kind of in the same franchise, but it has nothing to do with the original movie. It's a legacy sequel. I yeah. get it. Oh, I <laughs> love that. I love that. I hate it. Uh, you got to say it hard, too. So let's... Uh, I, haven't, I haven't watched this yet. And, I have no idea what to expect. And Chris Rock directed this. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and, cool. and helped write it, didn't he? I, I actually so. feel yeah. like he didn't write it, but we'll look it up later. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I forget. Sam Jackson's in it, too, which was a surprise to me whenever I saw the trailer drop. Mm -hmm. Just Same. a story. Just a st oh, okay, okay. Okay. Let's watch this. Here we go. Okay. Typical for Chris Rock music live so far. That's a guy from Facebook, right? No, yeah, the yeah, social yeah, network. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't know. Of course, Chris Rock gonna make I hate my wife and my life joke. <laughs> he looks great though. Is he not a Hanks kid? No. Okay. Oh. Twisted pictures. <laughs> I still can't get a a hold on like what this tone of this movie is. Yeah. I'm intrigued. It looks beautiful though. I like cinematography and I like his face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> I really just have no idea what this has to do with Saw. It's probably a copycat killer. Based on his teachings. <coughs> his eyes are so piercing. You want to play James, motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we saw a little bit of a yeah, it looks... death thing. <coughs> From the Book of Saw. Uh, is that giving away a lot? Wait, okay, does so that feel no. like it's giving away? Mm -mm. Oh, wait, that's my birthday. So it seems like they're kind of returning to the first saw yeah because basically like the first <laughs> they just all the sequels after saw one they kind of went into this like torture porn mm -hmm. uh like exploitation route where yeah. it's just like we're gonna set up all these scenarios of people dying horribly mm -hmm. and then just see those play out but the first saw was actually more of kind of like a a thoughtful thriller yeah about like you know this guy setting up this game where it's like you know you're trapped in here you're handcuffed to this thing at a certain time you're going to be killed unless you can figure out how to get out and it was kind of like a, about like people like <laughs> like morals and mm -hmm. people like you know figuring out what their moral for fortitude was and it seemed like maybe that was kind of returning to the original one uh, the first i only saw the first one and uh enjoyed it this looks in that vein and i, yeah, I like really this good. 
it this looks, looks very good. This looks good. I love the cop angle. It's not just a horror thing, but there's a cop angle. Chris Rock looks like he's about to act the fuck out. He of looks this. Yeah. great. Oh my god, yeah, he looks nuts. He looks I great. Love it. The one, the one thing that kind of sticks out to me is strange, both in the title and kind of way the way it's set up, where they walked into the room and the flashlight sign, and there was all those spirals all over the wall. And the movie's called Spiral. It seems like it's kind of like weirdly referencing or kind of like. Almost maybe stealing. I mean, I haven't seen the movie yet, so I don't know. But stealing the concept of this uh, manga by Junji Ito called Uzumaki. And Uzumaki is basically a story about this town that people start seeing spirals in different things. And the spirals start, like, messing with him in different ways. It starts out with this guy who gets obsessed with spirals. And he just wants to see them everywhere. And he kind of, like, looks for spirals everywhere. And it kind of drives him insane. And eventually he he wants to become a spiral. And so his family, one day they come home and they find him and he's just like turned himself into a spiral. And he's just like, they they open up this like basket and he's just inside the basket, just like he's turned it into a human spiral. And it's like, and and he's dead. And then like slowly everybody starts becoming obsessed with spirals and like spirals come into play and all these different like small sub stories. And it leads to this like, sort of like Lovecraftian bigger mm-hmm. cosmic horror where like the whole city is becoming a spiral and it, yeah it seems like it's weirdly referencing that in mm. some way mm. how do how do we feel about the book of saw i don't I, understand what i don't that know. i think they're yeah. gonna i think they're Sounds playing like it as thing. yeah i think that's what they're doing i think i think the book of saw is the teachings of what's of jigsaw and this is like some sycophant who's turned it into oh. a, a a new killing oh. craze that's interesting yeah, i think Either either way, I'm I'm, I'm I really do. Yeah, yeah, I'll yeah. see this. There's four things that caught my attention. The first one is Chris Rock. Chris Rock talking about marriage because mm. um, he, he hates, hates marriage. <laughs> he hates it, and I feel like he'll just throw that anywhere. It's the opening part of <laughs> it's the opening thing, and you see in a minute and forty six seconds. Fuck Yo, marriage. by the way, marriage yeah. sucks. Yeah, um, that's F- the first F-Y-I. thing. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny. I think I love my wife too. Yeah. The, from the book of Saw. From the book of Saw. <laughs> the second thing is the cinematography. I think it's, I mean, it, it, it's been done really well um, recently, but for a long time, I feel like it was really hard to light <laughs> people of color, especially black hmm. people, because I think, I think when you look back at old cinematography, it would just be like, hey, look, Certain people look good in this shot, and then um, the reverse shot wouldn't look that great for people of color. And I yeah, there's there's a different way to shoot black yeah, people. Yeah, you. Kelby have to figured it out. They just they haven't learned how to shoot black people until now. No, no, no. That's no, they why there've been out. no black people in movies. No, no, no. The thing oh. is, I mean, it, you got to shoot. You got to shoot them with gold light. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, yeah. When you when you go to when you go to film school, they teach you how to shoot black people. Yeah, they do. Um, Dude, wait, back so, up. <laughs> so many hang times on. they said shoot black That's people. On this not not really true. I took a class on it, and they were yeah. like, I, they were like, how do you shoot black people? And I was just like, I don't, I don't know. Just put turn the light on. He was like, no, the color, the color temperature. I, mean, I had a real crazy Yikes. teacher. So uh, yeah, and and I think that they followed the um, the rules there. The third thing is two black guys lead. A horror movie? Who's gonna die first? <laughs> I'm gonna call it Samuel L. Jackson is the spiral. Uh, he's the guy who's the sycophant. And the fourth one, they're yeah. Oh, yeah. is that the point? Oh, yeah. is that the point of the of the of the trailer? I thought they were trying to fake people out and like oh. make people think he's a cop. No, I helping. assumed that he was the one that captured he's Chris Rock. He's, yeah, a he's a bad guy. guy. Oh, he then I got the a, then I got the trailer exactly. <laughs> nice. First time. <laughs> and I think the fourth thing is that there's something about Chris Rock's eyes, face being so yeah. skinny and bony and just intense that it's, it's going to play a factor. His eyes look so piercing in this that it's it's going to play a factor in the movie one way whether it's a uh, outwardly or something that's you're gonna have to catch but um it, it looks great i mean it's a it's kind of it was kind of a shock but I, not so much because we're seeing the jordan peele type you mm-hmm. know comedians who are playing in horror where it's like it's starting to make sense like one can go with the other as you know as far as being the saddest clown in mm-hmm. the room like yeah let them play in horror this has made me want to see it more yeah, yeah. somebody somebody uh, had posted this trailer in a group and i saw people like the comments were just people being like 
saw isn't a comedy or like whatever. And, and then so, and then somebody down. somebody pointed out something funny, which is obvious, but it, you know, it just didn't it didn't click to me until I saw somebody saying this. But they were like, the four biggest names in horror right now are all comedians. It's like Jordan Peele, mm-hmm. John Krasinski, oh. uh, and Danny McBride, who wrote the Halloween movie. Um, oh, Danny McBride wrote that? Yeah, or not, not the four biggest, but the three biggest. And so they're wow. like, wow. they're like, like the three biggest names in horror right now are all like, yeah. come from like goofy comedies. Wow. So give them, give it a chance. Yeah, gummies. It looks really good. Yeah, it looks really, it looks good. really good. It looks really good. Solid. Yeah. I hope it's not. <laughs> I hope it's, hope it's terrible. No, it looks I interesting. Not, I don't yeah. understand. I don't oh. know that about, about the from the book of Saw. It reminds that the reason why that part kind of slightly worries me is because it reminds me of Eli? what book no of you will not but talk bad about the book, book of, of eli the book of eli fucking sucks but uh <laughs> that it reminds terrible the book of eli is terrible never saw it. but the but it reminds me of blair witch 2 they came out with a sequel to the blair witch project mm-hmm. and it was like and it was called blair witch 2 book of shadows oh. um oh, yeah. and it was horrible and it was like it was not like a like the first movie was like supposed to be like a found footage like documentary. The second movie was just like a straightforward narrative movie, and it was about people who like in the universe where the Blair Witch Project movie existed. They went out to the place where the Blair Witch movie supposedly took place, and they stays in, they stay in a cabin, and then people start getting possessed by the witch, and it was a horrible movie. Yeah, it sounds. Ugh. So up next, we got a brand new segment. Pew. Never before done on this show the segment is called can't go for that who can you who can go for that no 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 can you who can't go for that no 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 can you who can't go for that can't go for that can't go for that sax solo no who can go for that well done so every week there's always a handful of stories they don't have they don't have a whole lot of meat on the bone. It's either like a rumor of like somebody's reporting that this may be happening or it's a celebrity who comes out and says that they want to do something or it's like an unconfirmed thing and there's just no details about mm-hmm. it. So I figured instead of just talking about these in the regular news cuz there's really not a whole lot to discuss about them and what we end up discussing anyway is whether or not we think it's a good idea. Mm-hmm. So I decided to have a separate segment where we take these fledgling stories with no meat on the bone and then just talk about them briefly and then talk about whether or not we think that they're a good idea. So I'm going to go through these. Right. And they're like I said, they're a combination of rumors, unconfirmed things, and celebrities just saying that they want to do something. And we're going to briefly discuss them. And then we're all going to give our score of I can go for that or I can't go for that mm. for each movie. And I we're, I want to say I can't go for that for all of them because of the song. Because now it's fucking in my head. But you got to... So the first one is, uh, so apparently this has been a pitch for a new Pee Wee Herman movie that Paul Rubens has had in his back pocket for years. I don't think I wrote it down here, but it's, I, I feel like it was a thing that he's had, he's like been pitching and wanting to do since like the 90s. Mm. 90s, he's had the magic word. So Paul Rubens has an idea for a dark Pee Wee Herman movie called the Pee Wee Herman Story. He's taken it around and pitched it to people and he, he has not gotten a yes since he first started talking about this back in the 90s. But he's currently talking about it again and trying to get people interested in the project. So it's called The Pee Wee Herman Story. And the concept of the movie is the Pee Wee Herman Story would open with the titular character getting out of jail and embarking on a yodeling career. He then becomes a big name on the yodeling circuit and soon after a movie star. At this point, he develops a crippling addiction to drug and al- drugs and alcohol Behaves like a monster, lose all, loses all of its friends, and winds up in a mental institution receiving electroshock therapy. So this <laughs> Elton is Elton John story. <laughs> so this is a version of a Pee Wee Herman movie that he's been wanting to do for years and just can't get anybody to be interested in it because it's just obviously 
why would you make a movie like this based on the Pee Wee Herman mm -hmm. IP? Uh, and most recently, he pitched this to J Judd Apatow, and even Judd Apatow was like, no. Nah. And then they ended up doing the Netflix Pee Wee Herman yeah. movie that they did, which was obviously a lot less dark. Yeah. But he's talking about it now, and he wants to do it. And considering the fact that, you know, we tend to do things like this, like more and more people will do kind of like dark reinterpretations of things. I feel like eventually somebody is going to be interested in this enough to actually make it. Yeah. So what do you guys think? Can you go around the room? Yeah, we're going to go around the room. Can, right. I can go for that or I can't go for that. I can go for that. I'm here for it. Why? Because Pee Wee's <laughs> always been a low key dark character. Based on the first movie, not Big Top Pee Wee, which is kind of, you know, real kitty. Uh, but the first movie has got dark moments and the, the television show was way, way subtle with its innuendo. So I can go for it. Kelby? Whew, that took me on a journey. Yeah. Uh, when you first said it, I was like, I guess I can go for that because like Kirk said, it kind of already feels like it could be dark. But then you started explaining the movie, and then you said the word yodeling, and then I was like, I can't go for that at all. But then he becomes a movie star, and then he's on drugs, and then I was like, well, I can go for that. And then I thought about the fact that this is kind of like a kid's movie that turns into this, and oh, boy. If it gets made, it'll be one of the best movies of the year, so I'll go for it. <laughs> Does it change anything that... Within the continuity of the character Pee Wee Herman, he appears in multiple Cheech and Chong movies as Pee Wee Herman, mm -hmm. but playing him as like the sadistic, coked out maniac. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, now I am here. I can yeah. go for that. Yeah. I 100%. If that's like the character they play on, I'm 100% here for it. I could see it. It's yeah. I, I Honestly, I would think I think it would be in the same ballpark as the Joker movie. I, I could definitely see it. I, 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 I'll go for that. Yeah, I mean, I can go for that. Cool. Number one, because I love Pee Wee Herman. I love Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Yeah, it's a great movie. Great. Um, and I can also see because because of the like, even though Pee Wee Herman has existed in these like kids movies and the TV show, it started out as a Groundlings character, mm -hmm. and it, the original stage version of Pee Wee Herman was not a kids thing at all. It was an oh. adult oriented yeah. thing, and they sort of like reinterpreted it as a kids show for Pee Wee's Playhouse. Uh, so this character kind of can exist in both realms. Yeah. Plus the fact that I would just love to see the version of Pee Wee Herman from uh, Up in Smoke. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> of just like this crazy, crazy. Coke addict Pee Wee Herman. And also, I kind of uh, talked. We talked about this on our top ten movies of all time, or top ten movies of the decade. But a similar thing was the movie Frank, which I, which was like my number ten favorite movie of the decade. Frank was this talk show host character from the 80s in in Britain who wore this paper mache head and he was a talk show host. And then they took that character and like reimagined it as this character from this movie who was like this weird visionary songwriter mm -hmm. that lead, mm -hmm. led this band, this like avant-garde band. Yeah. And I just love the idea of like taking a real pop culture figure and then like making a movie that's like using that character but completely reinterpreting it as this other thing. Uh, so I could totally see a different alternate version of Pee Wee Herman where it's more dark and, mm -hmm. and like this. I might be scared. So in this, because you can make Pee Wee Herman for children for another hundred years. Yeah. But I think with this, it might become such a riveting thing that they don't want to lose the potential to make it a children's character. I definitely understand why they aren't and haven't made it because it just it's just really brand confusing. Yeah. Like if you make if you if it's like okay, so there's all these PB Herman things and they're for kids and like if you want to watch PB Herman there's this, but like don't watch this one yeah. because this one is like for adults. They'd have to just call it something else. Yeah. It, it would just have to be called I don't know, yodeling man. And then inside of the movie, they talk about this guy who, you know what I mean? Yeah. It just, it has to be a completely separate. Mm. Yeah. I kind of want it branded as Pee Wee. Yeah. And I want to see I, it as Pee Wee. Like I want to see it the whole uh -huh. thing. And there's not a lot of Pee Wee content out there to begin with. So it's not like there's going to be brand confusion. There was a movie a year ago, and before that, there hadn't been anything in years. So it's not that big of a like, oh, it's going to affect the brand. Yeah. I don't know anybody younger than myself 
that even yeah. knows what Pee Wee Herman is, yeah. even with the new movie, I would love it. I would love it. Yeah. Now mm-hmm. that, now I can go for that. I definitely can. Second one. So the creator of the 90s Disney afternoon show Gargoyles uh, has launched a Twitter campaign in hopes of reviving the show. So if you don't know, the entire series of Gargoyles, 78 episodes, has is on Disney+. Plus. The creator of Gargoyles has basically went on Twitter and said, like, keep like w- go on Disney Plus and watch that because if enough people show interest and are watching it and if Disney sees that data and they see like holy shit like so many people are watching Gargoyles they'll bring the show back and he mentions that this is the same thing that happened for uh a bunch of other animated shows like Young Justice which is like a a DC uh, show that was about like young versions of superheroes and it had like gotten canceled and then like there was a fan campaign to bring it back and then that ended up getting it brought back. And so he wants people to binge Gargoyles on Disney Plus so that they can bring the show back. Uh, and also there's also been this long standing news story uh, that's been around for months and months that Jordan Peele wants to do a reboot of Gargoyles. So if you don't know... Uh, Gargoyles is a is an animated Disney show from the 90s, and it's about a bunch of these characters called Gargoyles, and they exist back in the 17th century, and what they are is they're basically like these monsters, and by day they're stone, and then at night they break free from the stone, and mm. they get cursed by a wizard on, in the first episode uh, to be frozen in, in their stone form uh, until some prophecy happens, I forget, I'm very fuzzy on the details of it. And so they end up getting woken up in modern day New York City. Mm -hmm. And they're gargoyles on a random building in New York. Mm -hmm. They get woken up and then they team up with a female detective. And then they basically just fight crime. Um, And it was Keith David is the voice of the main character, Goliath, the main gargoyle. Mm -hmm. And um, it's basically just, it's like like surprisingly dark and serious for a Disney cartoon. Mm -hmm. And like... Genuinely one of my favorite shows when I was a kid, and they want to bring it back. So, Kirk, can you go for that? I'm going to abstain because I don't know it. But just based on that. I can't go for that. I don't like gargoyles. Wow. You don't like gargoyles? The idea of gargoyles? I asked to abstain. No, no, that's fine. You but... said give an answer. I'm giving But what my is answer. I don't like gargoyles I don't mean? care about gargoyles. The concept that he just explained or the idea of Both. stone? Okay, gotcha. Both. Don't care. <laughs> Gotcha. So that's why. That's why I asked to abstain because I don't right. have the history of it. I wish I wish we had let you abstain. <laughs> yep. Kelby? <sighs> Off the top of my head, I would go for that. Um, I do remember as a kid being like, man, this is kind of a dark show um, visually and conceptually. And, it, and the creatures are real creepy. But it's cool in some kind of way. It's still cool. Mm-hmm. I'm just going off the memory of that. Um, I don't know if I watch it today. Would I still f- like it? Um, so without without seeing it at all from whenever it was popular 15 years ago, um, I would go for that. Really quick, uh-huh. Kirk. Does this in any way change your opinion? Are you gonna tempt Bless me? You, I think. Thank you very much. This is the opening theme song from Gargoyles. Wow. Gargoyles. Well, not when, now. not when Gargoyles. Tyler's singing it. <laughs> oh, that's Keith David right there, right? Yeah. It's a lion from uh, Aladdin. Oh, yeah. I mean, this part is not convincing me at all. This is super serious. It's very, like, it's really dark. Good. It's good, good stuff. Mm, not really. I wish you didn't show this to me. It just looks Why? like a, it just looks like a, it looks like a cartoon. What do you mean you wish you didn't this didn't show this to you? Because it, 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 it feels like it's something that was that's good for. 15 years ago. It's I good for now. This you, is this is great. Are you changing? I think I might flip. I, I think just leave it <laughs> just leave it for that time that it was good. I uh well, that's it. I Tyler. Think you guys are terrible people. I think this is I think it's amazing. I want to and and I don't know how you're going to feel about it, but I definitely want it to be live action instead. I would 
I, I think this should 100% be yeah. live action. I think they should uh, put out a movie real quick, just live action movie, get everybody interested, and then continue it with the show. Yeah, Jack, a little quick $300 million investment, whatever. I can go either way with it, <laughs> live action or animated. They got it. They got it. I can. I must go for that. <laughs> I must go for that. Yeah. Cool. Gargoyles go is so that. good. That's good. It's just dark, I think. Now watch me go 100% the other way on this next one. <laughs> so there is a uh, a Misery remake reportedly in development. A Misery me- remake is now in early development. Furthermore, sources say that the new project will be a modernized take on King's best-selling novel. Beyond that, however, details are pretty scarce due to how early on it is. So a remake of Misery, keeping it in mind that they just did the, the season of Castle Rock, which is like a Stephen King... What do, you, what do you call it whenever there's like a show where like one season is one story and then the next season oh, an, is a different an anthology. anthology? Well, an anthology, an anthology is like series. when each episode is different. I wonder if you could but, still call it that for the season because then what's like American Horror Story? Yeah, but, I don't know. Yeah. I, anth- I don't know what that is called, but yeah. something like an anthology. But it's an, it's an anthology where like each season is yeah. about a different mishmash of Stephen King stories. And the latest season was like basically like a prequel to Misery, where it's like the character that Kathy P- Bates is, mm-hmm. like when she was younger, like moving to this town, mm-hmm. and she's played by Lizzie Kaplan. Uh, so like that Lizzie. that Love show Lizzie exists Kaplan. and has been running for the you know this season, mm-hmm. and now they're gonna remake Misery, which is you know about a an author who gets into a car accident in the middle of... In Maine or New Maine, Hampshire. Maine, and then uh, somebody finds him. Kathy Bates saves him. Kathy Sa- Bates she saves, saves him. him, but then it turns out she's like an obsessed fan, yeah. and so he quickly mm-hmm. realizes that she's not letting him leave. Yeah. And then it has the iconic scene where he tries to escape, or he's planning on escaping, Yep. and so she takes a sledgehammer and... Hobbles him. Hobbles him, just yeah. snaps his leg in half. Jesus have you Have you Christ. read the book? I never read the book. Read in the, the book. book, spoiler, she cuts off his uh, feet. Oh, instead of hobbling him? And then and then cauterizes. Oh, that's cooler. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to say I can't go for that because I've read the book. The mm-hmm. book is great. Saw the movie. The movie is great. You can update it all you want. I still mm-hmm. don't care. It's still the same story. Right. You're not really changing that much. I guess maybe maybe he's not a author because print is dead. So yeah. Who, so I, I don't know really what you're going to have to offer. But they oh, already no. did it twice brilliantly. There's no need to do yeah. a third. I'm not here for it. He's an influencer. <laughs> oh, my God. If he's an influencer? He's a and it, yes. I will, if Basically it, Logan Paul. Oh, my God. <gasps> no, he would have oh. to be a serious influencer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like somebody who... Oh, he's like, like Casey Gary Neistat. V. Casey like Neistat. Casey Neistat. Casey Neistat, and he actually plays himself. As Casey Neistat? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I that, what does he do? Like political? Casey stuff? Neistat? Casey he's, Neistat? He's the biggest YouTuber out there. Like he makes he makes short uh, movies as he calls them, like describing his entire life. I mean, I would oh, pay okay. I would yeah. pay to invest in that movie. <laughs> yeah, that sounds yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. That I can get behind. But this is not what yeah. it's what it's about. I was thinking more like a TYT or um, what's the name of that guy who talks a little bit? Uh, Philip DeFranco. Philip DeFranco. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would love. I a mean, Philip Casey, DeFranco Casey Neistat's misery. bigger than Philip DeFranco. Really? Yeah, but okay, but I don't know who that is. Yeah, I would love the the. Oh man, that kind of made my day to think about <laughs> think about Philip DeFranco in a misery like movie. That'd be great. Kelby, but, Kelby, what you what you? Oh, yeah, yeah, I could sorry. definitely go for that. As as you were explaining to me, because I'm not super familiar with the movie, but mm-hmm. as you were explaining to me, I had the shot sequences, the coloring, the editing already in my head. Like I was like, I can so see that. I could see the car in Maine. I could I would have the drone shot mm-hmm. pushing down in the shot with his. Eyes opening, blood. I can see every. I think you just described the sequence of him crashing and and waking up in Kathy Bates's house. I think you just. Oh no, I can. Made the original. I can literally see it. Like if they want me to direct it, please call me. Yeah. Talk about it. I'm here for it, 100. <laughs> percent I'm not here for it. I don't. I they like you said they did it twice really this well. This segment is not called. I'm not here. Oh, for I'm it. sorry. I can't go for it. I'm, I'm sorry. I can do whatever I want. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can't go for that. Mindset. They did two already. Uh, the book, the movie. <laughs> Say it right unless you're black. Oh. oh. <laughs> <laughs> then, <laughs> then do whatever you need. Andrew is party. Whatever you like. <laughs> Andrew is over party on Twitter. But if they're going to start redoing Stephen King books that were already made into films, <laughs> do other ones that just came out really shitty. 1401, Cell, anything with... John Cusack, just fucking remake it. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, this part your stand up routine. Wow. You're testing this out. This is my tight five. Golly, John Cusack ain't do nothing to you. He's a good well, man. oh, sorry, a not man. not anything that they made with John Cusack in general. Anything Stephen King that has John Cusack in it should be remade. 
they're yeah. all it's just bad hot takes. is 2012 yeah. a John, uh, Stephen King, King movie uh, no. Okay. <laughs> Andrew, what's your take? Uh, yeah, I, I I can't go for that. Um, I mean, it, I'm sure it'll be it would be fine, but I just really have no interest in a remake of Misery. Mm. Like none of the Stephen King remakes have really ever been good. Like you know, they did like the remake of Carrie, and they, oh, they've yeah. always just been kind of like blah to me. Remaking a Stephen King movie is kind of similar to like these live action remakes of Disney movies where they just feel so phoned in that I'm just they're just never really interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's probably because nobody cares. It, yeah. It's just a money grab. Yeah. But if like Stephen King is like the Disney of horror mm-hmm, right. of just like now they're just mining back through all of his old mm-hmm. shit and like kind of cynically cranking out remakes. Yeah. That's why I'm saying if they got somebody like me who heard this idea and is really like could be passionate about it. <laughs> He's really fine for this. Nah, job. well, it, it's deeper than Stephen that. Stephen King I'm, does listen to this podcast. That's true. I'm here for it. So that's that's what I'm saying. Like if they're just like Sam Raimi does these, <laughs> put them in it. Here's a script that somebody wrote. Put, make it. Then it would probably come out bad, no matter the talent. But if somebody was just like, "This is awesome," it w- they could make it awesome. I can see it already. I'm tired of them. Remake. I guess it's because popularity sake, but like they remake Stephen King's old tired shit the same amount. Like Misery and all that stuff is is his most known, but he has entire books full of stories that nobody is talking about. Like the Skeleton Crew would be perfect for a TV show to make, and they're doing the old books turned into uh, TV shows instead. Like there are there are five page short stories from Stephen King that would scare the shit out of anybody more than the Mist does, and. Mm. I think it's, it it comes down to business. Yeah, that's what I. That's the you know, yeah. You can make more money off that TV show than that's you can true. make in that movie. True. I don't know, man. Thomas Jane trying to cry is pretty scary. <laughs> Next two are a Jim Carrey double whammy. Damn. Bang bang. Uh, yeah. So Jim Carrey recently in an interview talked about his idea for a dark and depressing Truman Show two. So speaking with Collider, Jim Carrey was asked which one of his classic comedy movies from the '90s he thought he would, would be the first to be remade in today's era of reboots and remakes. Feeling its story is probably more relevant now than ever, Carey responded with The Truman Show, and his reasoning for it makes a lot of sense. I think Truman Show is something that exists on the micro on a micro level now. You know, it was kind of a story about that on a macro level, but now everybody has a subscriber channel, and everybody has their own little Truman Show world. I often think, and I'm asked about what I uh, think would be would have been uh, happened to Truman when he goes outside the wall. And it took me a while to realize that basically he was alone out there too because everybody went back inside. They all wanted to be in the dome. <laughs> so essentially, you know, his idea for a Truman Show 2 would be like Truman's life after escaping the show. And that may be like he just doesn't know how to cope with living in a real world and how different things are from the sort of crafted uh, deterministic world that he lived in inside of the dome. And that may be like in the years since then, he just still feels as alone and isolated as he did inside of the show because of, you know, kind of how isolated and and alone our sort of world is now. And that maybe he would like have a YouTube channel and be like, I'm Truman Burbank. Remember me? The the guy who was in that show and now I have a vlog or whatever. So (laughs) basically being about, about him living in the real world, but the real world kind of being the same as it was in the show because he's as alone as he was and also he just like has a YouTube channel and nothing really changed for him. I can go for that. Yes, I wa- I really, really would love to see that. I love the idea of a dark, cynical Truman Show. I love the idea that because the Truman Show uh, that we know ended on such an uplifting high note of like, I'm going to go escape into this. I'm, I'm escaping this world. I'm going to have my own adventure. And he gets into the real world and realizes that the real world sucks. Yeah. I love that idea. And that he's like, shit, even like, shit, I left a really good thing. And the real world is a piece of shit. I got to get back. I love it. Yeah. Yep. I'm not going to have a real explanation as for why I can't go for that. But just you explaining it, I wouldn't watch it. Half and half. The way you explained it, I Mm. can't go for that. But if it was a if it was a dark tale about him coming out and the years leading up to the 2010s when this stuff started happening, like when vloggers became popular and he starts to like see the world go towards 
the life that he used to live and then like PTSD starts kicking in about how he thinks he's still in like some kind of simulation or he's realizing that people are starting to make their lives into what he's hated. So he like starts to go deeper into himself and notices like the world is turning into exactly what I uh, was living in before I knew what the real world was. So he kind of loses his sanity altogether again. And, and eventually thinks or has to go back into the... So you would show. like it if it was exactly the way that I described that he pitched it as. No, you said that it was afterwards when when he was... Uh, when it already happened, he has a YouTube channel. And like I mean, that was just me speculating. Well, that's what I mean. I don't... I, I, want, I want the years... All he said, was, he, all he was, said that it was, was... Is that the movie would deal with like Truman coming out of the show and mm-hmm. then sort of re- and then also being alone and realizing that the real world is not that different from what he was living before. Yeah. Okay. Then yeah, I, I can go for it, but just more of I want because he was. What was the time period he was living in, in in the show? I mean, it was the late '90s. No, in the show, in the show, he was living in like the '50s in the show, like when no, no, it was just it was no. it was just modern it was just day. The it was modern day. But I okay. Well, then never mind. But, I think it just it had kind of a Leave It to Beaver feel. That's to what it. I. Yeah. But he was living in modern day. Like okay, the time so period even was in the time period, he knew life. he was yeah. living in the nineties. Yeah. Okay, then. Yeah, I would love to watch his his time from the nineties coming to the two thousand tens. That's what the movie should be about. Yeah, I mean, I can go for that for the mm-hmm. same reason. Yeah. Basically, the combination of what Kirk and Tyler said. Yeah. I, I, that, that'd be super interesting. To see. Way interesting. Yeah. The next one. So also in a different interview, Jim Carrey was asked about remaking The Mask. He was asked about it, and he let slip the one condition that must be met if he was to reprise his role of Stanley Ipkiss. He said uh, he doesn't think in terms of sequels and stuff like that before going on to add The Mask. I think it depends on the filmmaker, really. I, I don't I, I don't want to just do it just to do it. But I would only do it if it was some crazy visionary filmmaker. Uh, so he essentially was like, I would only do a remake if it was like done by some crazy visionary filmmaker that would do some insane er- interpretation of it. And, you know, a little bit of backstory in that. So The Mask, that movie, I mean, number one, if you watch The Mask, if you go back and watch it, it's basically like a live action cartoon. Mm-hmm. Like his character is based on old, like basically like lecherous cartoon characters from the Looney Tunes era. So like the the wolf, I mean, he even does mm-hmm. that thing at one point in the movie where his jaw drops and then he's like stamping his foot yeah. and howling. And the, the the movie was based on a comic created by uh, Mike Richardson that the movie was based on was like even crazier than the movie. And it was also super dark. Mm-hmm. Like the, 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 the comic is like super gory and there's just tons of killing in it. Um, and they sort of like lightened it up. So I think what he was kind of saying is like, I would do a, I would do a re a, a sequel or a reboot or whatever of the mask. If it was done by a crazy visionary filmmaker that was like more willing to go into the extreme of the comic and how kind of viscerally insane the comic is. And then secondarily, the the uh, in a different interview, the creator, Mike Richardson of the comic, uh, he said that he would like to do the mask with a woman as the main character. I can't go for that. No can do. I don't really care about the mask. Either the comic book, <laughs> the movie was, doesn't really hold up to the test of time, so I don't see the need for it, whether it's going to be dark mm-hmm. or uh, the same thing. And um, I just don't care. I like the idea of a woman. That's kind of interesting if they would do that. But Jim Carrey, I feel like Jim Carrey's going to do it, and he's just going to be way over the top extra, like way going for it. And I'm just going to be like, whoa, you're a lot to take in. So I can't go for that. Okay. Uh, when I think of Jim Carrey, I, I instantly think of The Mask. Instantly. Mm-hmm. It's the first thing I, I think of. Uh, I don't know because I feel like Jim Carrey gives me – he gives me mixed messages, and I I, I don't know because after Spawn he did back. <laughs> after he did Jackass no not Jackass Jackass right? Dumb and Dumber no Dumb no, no, no no the superhero Sonic no it's Kick Ass Kick Ass mm. too and he was like I don't want I don't I didn't want to do it I didn't know it was so violent and all the stuff and then now he wants to do the Mask too where he's a, like it's gory and violent and all the stuff I'm just like a little confused as to what he wants to do. Mm. And the idea of it, I think, it may sound cool. I can see visually where it's where it could go. I don't know. It just doesn't really. It doesn't really pique my interest. I think that's just kind of come and gone already. Um, I, I would say it. I would say if I had to go for it, it would be right on that fence of 
Yeah, but yeah, yeah, maybe. And then uh, see, as a woman, I I don't know. That doesn't do anything for me. So, who did? And forgive me, who did Requiem for a Dream? Darren Aronofsky. Darren Aronofsky. So let's get Aronofsky to do an addiction piece about Stanley coming to terms with being addicted to the power of the mask, but knowing that the mask is a terrible person. Because the mask is like a misogynistic, the the wolf character guy, like he does a lot of that stuff. And so he's Johnny Bravo. The mask, the mask in the movie is is being canceled for the most part to, to modernize it. And Stanley has to go with, do I give this power up? It's like a drug, basically. Or do I do I continue to stay with it and deal with the public consequences of of wanting to be this person? And I think you could treat it as an addiction if he wants to go high concept with the director. So does that mean you're here for it? Or yeah, I'm here for it. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if that would work because uh, you Dan know, Aronofsky it, been trash for the past. Has he? Well, no, because if you if you don't know the the mask, so basically the mask is Loki, it's the spirit of of Loki. I don't know if a god would care about being canceled. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's the thing. A god wouldn't. But Stanley's a man when he takes the mask off, and that's the that's the addiction part of it. Is he's he's addicted to that power that Loki get, that the mask gives him. If because because the, the mask like he's like a force of destruction. Like everywhere he goes, he leaves just destruction in his path. So right. if if anybody knew that he was the mask, he would just be immediately arrested. So again, that's the, he. Nobody still nobody knows he's the mask unless. Does anybody know in the end of the mask? Because I can't, I can't think of it. I, th- I mean, I think Cameron Diaz knows. Yeah, other than her, like nobody the, knows the gangster that he's the mask. bad guy. But also, again, he he can hide that he's the mask through the entire movie, and then at the end comes to terms with that he needs to let it go, and then turns himself in, and the mask gets put in some Indiana Jones style crate. You know what I mean? Yeah, I can go for that. I'd like to see this. Yeah. I love the mask. Um, I, and I I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend like I'm super knowledgeable about the comics. I've never read the comics. Uh, I just know that they exist. Next story. So uh, Margot Robbie is a pro- and her production company are reportedly developing a Tank Girl reboot. Margot Robbie is setting her sights on another comic book-based franchise as well, and that's Tank Girl. Um, apparently, this has been brewing for months as co-creator Alan Martin made it all public by tweeting the following. Uh, just heard that Margot Robbie's company has optioned rights from MGM to ta- make a new Tank Girl movie. Now several months into development, we haven't been contacted by any of the parties involved with the project. Not sure, so not sure if there will be any input from the original creators. There was a uh, Tank Girl as a comic. Uh, there was a movie adaptation in 1995 starring Lori Petty. It was a critical and financial failure. Uh, I I used to I, I I watched Tank Girl a bunch when it came on HBO when I was a kid, and I always loved it. Uh, it it's very bizarre, um, but I thought it was great. Tank Girl is a British comic created by Jamie Hewlett and Alan Martin. Uh, Tank Girl drives a tank, which is also her home. She undertakes a series of missions for a nebulous organization before making a serious mistake and being declared an outlaw for her sexual inclinations and her substance abuse. The comic centers on her misadventures with her boyfriend Booga, a mutant kangaroo. The comic style is heavily influenced by punk visual art, and strips are frequently deeply disorganized, anarchistic, uh, absurdist, and psychedelic. Um, and as an added piece of, of trivia, in case you don't know, one of the co-creators, Jamie Hewlett, he co-created the Gorillas. So the Gorillas consists of Damon Albarn, who is the front man for Blur. He does all the music, and uh, Jamie Hewlett created and does all the animation for the c- animated band characters. Hmm. So Tank Girl has a very similar visual style to Gorillas. So if you can picture what the Gorillas look like, that's kind of what Tank Girl looks like. Um, and Tank Girl is just kind of like this crazy. Uh, frenetic uh, action comic about this insane uh, girl who just goes around just like fucking everything that moves and drinking heavily and killing people uh, in this like post-apocalyptic Australia. Um, It's really good. And the movie was uh, kind of similar to that and it was about her fighting against uh, this evil corporation headed by uh, the villain played by Malcolm McDowell who are basically invented invented a device where they because there's a water shortage, there's no water, and so they can like stick this thing into you and it sucks out all of your water, and then they can like sell the water and it completely drains you of all your water and you turn into a burnt out husk. And so that yeah, so Margot Robbie is is looking to do a a, a reboot of that, and obviously, uh, she would play Tank Girl. Uh, can't imagine her being like, oh, and also you know such and such is going to play Tank yeah. Girl, like it's going to be her. And it's very fitting because 
Tank Girl is very similar to her interpretation of Harley Quinn. Mm -hmm. Like, it would just be the same mm -hmm. character, basically. I can go for that. Sure. I can do it. I never saw Tank Girl, but I know a, a lot of uh, my friends were big into it, both the comic book and love the movie. And I think the movie has become kind of a kind of a cult classic. It's absolutely a cult yeah. classic. And um, Lori Betty was great. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I like that. Uh, I love the gorillas. They're awesome. Um, so I'm here for that. And Margot Robbie, perfect casting. Do it. Make it happen. Yep. I, I don't think Margot Robbie's the perfect casting, though. Well, I think you're not the perfect I, casting. I, I don't want to yeah, see her play the same character just with an Australian accent. Like, I, Sure, I do. I don't. It's Sure, it's that's what that. every actor does. All right, God. Sorry. <laughs> Variations on a theme. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. That's not how you say it. I can't go for that. No, Why? I can't go for that. Wait. I, I, I mean, I guess so. Make it. Um, I feel like she's putting herself in a corner, so I'm kind of coming at it from a different perspective. I feel like if I was just like, oh, I want to watch that, then sure, I guess I want to watch that. But um, I've already seen her do this in as Harley Quinn, and I'm go I'm gonna go see her do it as Harley Quinn in whenever the the new movie comes out. So yeah. at this point, I'm just like, yeah, whatever, That's try it. something else. Why couldn't they get Laura Petty? Is that her? Is Lori, first, of all, Lori Petty. first of all, she's way too old. Yeah, she's way too old to be a comic book character. Just later in life, it's an old Laura, Laura Petty. Like they would never do that. They would be. Yeah, I mean, Laura Take Petty is a young girl. Yeah, Laura Petty's great. Like she's on. She was on Orange Is the New Black, but she played one of the older inmates I, in it. That's Laura fuck. Petty. She's great. Now. Jesus Christ! You just yeah. saved my entire life. I've been thinking about that since I started watching that show about where oh, I know that yeah, character from, Petty. and I've refused to Google it. That's Laura Petty. Okay, yeah. I mean, all right. Now that that's, so, I'm here for it. <laughs> I definitely can go for that. I'd love to see the Tank Girl. I'd be movie. shocked if you didn't. And I, I think that Margot Robbie is perfect for it. I don't care that it's similar to Harley Quinn because I feel like she could do it a little differently. And also, you know, who gives a shit? Just Tank Girl's a different character, even if her acting performance is similar. I also think like Harley Quinn, at least you know in. Harley Quinn, at least in those movies, the way that it's played and the way that she interprets it, it's very kind of like male gazy. It's like mm -hmm. very much like, oh, like here's like a fetishistic crazy girl. Whereas Tank Girl is not like that. It's not like a male gaze thing. It's yeah, like, isn't she just straight up badass? Yeah, and she's yeah. just like, straight fuck you. And she's yeah. very, very, very feminist uh, character. Um, so it would be different either way. Uh, yeah, I would love to see that. Last one. So a new Silent Hill movie has been announced. A uh, new Silent Hill has been announced alongside a new Fatal Frame movie. Word of the movies comes out comes way of director Christopher uh, Christoph Gans, uh, who casually revealed as much during a recent interview with French outlet uh, Allocine. According to the director, the former will be set in a small American town ruled over by Puritanism. 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 Uh, meanwhile, the latter will take place in Japan in an attempt to capture its Japanese haunted house setting. Uh, he said, I have two horror film projects with Victor Hadida. Uh, I'm working on the adaptation of the video game Project Zero or Fatal Frame. Uh, the film will take place in Japan. I especially don't want to uproot the game from its Japanese haunted house setting. And we're also working on a new Silent Hill. The project will always be anchored in this atmosphere of a small American town ravaged by Puritanism. I think it's time to make a new one. So Christoph Gans directed the, the first Silent Hill movie. Silent Hill is a video game. Uh, it was kind of like alongside Resident Evil is kind of one of the early survival horror games. Um, it was a lot more creepy and kind of psychologically fucked up than Resident Evil. Uh, I loved Res Silent Hill when I was a kid. Uh, I played that first one a lot. I played the uh, second one. I kind of fell off after that. But the first Silent Hill is a classic. Uh, they made this movie uh, in the early 2000s. And it was pretty good. It was like it was definitely not what I expected it to be. But it was decent. It was de certainly better than the Resident Evil movies. And so now the same director is looking to reboot it. And they're also making a Fatal Frame game. Fatal Frame is another or Fatal Frame movie. Fatal Frame is another video game from that era of survival horror games uh, where you uh, are traveling around in these sort of like uh, rural Japanese areas where uh, there are ghosts and then you have a camera and you have to like capture the ghost with the camera. Um, and they're just really creepy, really kind of haunting games. Both classics and now they're making modern day reboot movies of both games. I mean, why don't you just sing it for me? You know what I'm going to say. Don't, don't. I can't go for that? No can do. 
No well, do. And do you know? Do you want to know why? Why? Because all those words I didn't understand anything. <laughs> I n- oh, they old have person no, reasons. They have no meaning to me. I mean, this is a, Silent Hill is it's just a, it's a game. Don't know anything about slash it. Slash story Don't where care. a person comes into this small town called mm. Silent Hill. They get trapped there. There's monsters and zombies. They have to fight their way through monsters and zombies. No. Nah. To get out. No can do. I can't go for that. Um, I don't know very much about it. So in my quick Googles, I just see that the um, uh, the movie got pretty <laughs> horrible reviews and didn't make any money. So yeah. why do it again? So I can't go for that. I don't care. And I don't know why he should either. I'm always I'm always here for more uh, horror movies. None of them are good nowadays. So keep trying. I'm here for it. I, I can go for that. Yeah, uh, I I can't go for that. Uh, number one because Ooh, they never I take. Whoa, they never flipping the um, script. Video game movies are never good. Like they've just never made a good video game movie. There because the thing about it is is like even at the height of like cinematic storytelling in a movie or in a in a video game. It's still like not as good as a movie, mm-hmm. like you, like The Last of Us. It's like, oh yeah, The Last of Us it has a great story. But if you made The Last of Us into a movie, it would be just kind of like not that good of a movie. It's mm-hmm. really the interactivity that, that makes the that pushes right. those movie those over the, those stories over the top and makes them really good and cinematic. It has to have the interactivity. When they when they make a movie out of it, it just kind of like falls flat. Are you telling me that Mortal Kombat is a Bad movie. I mean, I love Mortal Kombat, but it's not a good <laughs> it's movie. It's not a good movie. So, so you know, there really isn't a good track record of making good video game movies. The first Silent Hill movie that made by the same guy was just kind of eh. So I have no high hopes for that same exact director making a good mm. movie. And then the second one that came out, there was another Silent Hill movie that was even worse. Um, so I have no expectations for this, and I really have no expectations for video game movies in general. Um, so yeah, I can't go for that. Mm, uh, so that, so that was, that was, uh, that was our, can you go for that segment? But more importantly than our opinions, we want to hear your opinion. So with any, any of these movies, uh, if you want to weigh in and talk about whether you can or can't go for them, then, uh, you can, you can email us at nostalgiacastpod at gmail.com, or you can leave a message in the comments if you're seeing the video version of this, but uh, whether it's the comments or uh, if you email us at nostalgicastpod at gmail.com, we will come back to this next episode and talk about the uh, audience poll of whether or not you can or can't go <laughs> for these uh, new nostalgic reboot properties that might happen. I could tell you what the comments are going to be right now. <laughs> Don't these nerds have anything better to talk about? Boy, that was loud. Yeah, that was real loud. And this has been... <laughs> I'm here for it. Last but not least, before we end the show, one last story. R.I.P. R.I.P. To the OG, the legend, my man. I am Spartacus. <laughs> I am Spartacus. I am Spartacus. It's our guy, Spartacus. <laughs> He didn't finish that. Didn't finish yes. that. Yeah. Someone hasn't seen Spartacus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mine's up. Kirk Douglas. <laughs> Kirk Douglas. Kirk Douglas passed away at 103. 103. Okay, okay. Dugs didn't do Life goals. Yeah. <laughs> Kirk Douglas, an icon of Hollywood's golden age and star of such films as Spartacus, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which is on Disney+. Plus. It's great. Watch it. The Bad and the Beautiful. Not on Disney+. Plus. Great. Find it and watch it. Seminal noir film, uh, and champion died Wednesday of natural causes. He was one of he was one hundred and three. Michael Douglas, his son, posted on Instagram. Uh, it is with tremendous sadness that my brothers and I announced that Kirk Douglas left us today at the age of one hundred and three. To the world, he was a legend, an actor from the golden age of movies who lived well into his golden years, a humanitarian who's committed to justice and the causes he believed in, set a standard for all of us to aspire to. And yeah, it really is the end of an era. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Like, yeah. Something that I think is super beautiful is the fact that he got to see his son live out to be 75 That's years crazy. old. That's crazy. That is a big, yeah. big, rare yeah. treasure and a blessing. And Absolutely. You know, he lived, he lived uh, um, 
I, I can't say if he lived a full life, you know, per se, but, <laughs> you know, because I don't know him. Yeah. But he, he got to see a lot of things that um, I'm, en- I'm envious of. Yep. Oh, I am not envious. I, I'm really happy that he got to live to 103. God damn it. I mean... <sighs> I can only hope to live that long. Man, yeah. good his, God, no. Uh, his kids I, had their dad in their no, life beyond yeah. retirement. That's so good that's for so good for them and good for him, but that sounds torturous. All right. <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you like this and you haven't already, feel free to subscribe on anywhere you get your podcasts. Um, or our YouTube channel, if that's where you're watching this. If you want to find out more about us, about the show, about the other nostalgic content we post on a daily basis, you can join our you can follow our Facebook page. Nostalgia on Facebook, the official Nostalgia page. Or you can follow our YouTube channel, Nostalgia. Or you can join our Facebook group, which is the Nostalgia Facebook group. If you have any thoughts or ideas or questions that you want to be read live on one of our episodes, uh, especially if you want to weigh in on the uh, Can You Go For That uh, poll, then you can email us at nostalgicastpod at gmail.com. If you want to support us in a more monetary way, you can go to our Facebook page, the Nostalgia Facebook page, and you can, at the top of the page, there's a button that says Become a Supporter. Click that, and for $4.99 a month, not only do you support the show, but you also get access to exclusive bonus content, whether it's bonus episodes or videos that uh, are not is not otherwise available to you. Thanks for listening.